Township Planning Board meeting Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. I hereby declare this meeting of the Howell Township Planning Board to be open, adequate notice having been given pursuant to the New Jersey Open Public Meeting Act in the following manner. First, on January 27, 2020, copy of said notice was mailed to the Asbury Park Press and the Tritown News. Second, on January 27, 2020, a copy of said notice was hand delivered to the clerk of the Township of Howell. Third, on January 27, 2020, said notice was posted in the office of the planning board and on the bulletin board in the Howell Township Municipal Building, 4567 Route 9, Howell Township, New Jersey. On October 2, 2020, a notice was sent to both the Asbury Park Press and the Star Ledger that this meeting would be held remotely on Zoom using communication equipment due to COVID-19 restrictions. Please note that this meeting is being videotaped for possible future broadcast on Howell Township TV 77. For members of the public, you will remain in the audience until the chairman opens the hearing up for members of the public to ask questions or comment on an application. At that time, I ask you to raise your hand and you will be brought into the meeting one at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Roll call, please. Mr. Bozovic. I have not heard from him. Mr. Dorado. Here. Mr. Husser. Here. Chief Kudrick has been excused. Mr. Leggio. Here. Mr. Nicastro. Here. Mr. Seaman. Here. Mr. Bavai. I have not seen Mr. Bavai either. I know he had trouble logging in. Mr. Everett. Here. Deputy Mayor O'Donnell. Here. Chairman Tannenhaus. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I think we go into the pledge. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. For those that can stand, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for all of our first responders and those serving abroad and here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, do we have approval of minutes? We have no minutes this evening. Okay, do we have any vouchers? We have no vouchers this evening. Uh, any in, in correspondence, we have a couple of ordinances. Yes, and I also have an email from Vince Halloran. He is the attorney for Omnicos Realty, which is the second application on tonight's agenda. They were supposed okay. to with the Environmental Commission. Unfortunately, they could not meet with them in November due to other applicants being scheduled prior to them. So they now have an appointment with the Environmental Commission on December 9th. So they asked if we would kindly carry this matter to December 17th, 2020 with no further notice and they don't expire till the end of December. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Mr. Chairman, the application of Omnicos Realty Incorporated case number SP-1076 will be carried to the board's December 17th, 2020 uh, virtual meeting. Um, Eileen, the uh, directions on how to access the meeting on the 17th are the same as tonight or will they be different? No, they're the same as tonight and they will be on the agenda. Okay, and the agenda will be available at least 10 days prior. Yes. Um, all uh, documents associated with the application are available online. The meeting begins seven o'clock. There will be no further notice to property owners. Thank you. The only other Thank thing you. I have is the uh, dates for next year. I'll send them out tomorrow if everybody could look at them so we can discuss them at the meeting on the 17th. Uh, there are okay. a few Very well. more conflicts. And after that, the only other thing we have to comment on the ordinances tonight. Okay, um, if you guys didn't see in the background, it seems that uh, my daughter's 
swim meet ended a little earlier than anticipated. So, Mr. Cuchero, I'm going to let uh, Nick take over as the chairman for right now, and I'm going to listen in and make comment appropriately, if that's okay. okay. Uh, the meeting is now yours, Vice Chairman. Okay, so we're moving on to correspondence and the ordinance reviews for consistency with the master plan. And I guess, Eileen, we have four of them tonight. Yes, we uh, do. So A being ordinance 020-20-18 to amend chapter 188-4 of definitions. Yes. I don't know if you want to go one by one, Ron, or... Um, Mr. Chairman, yeah, we'll go one by one, and I'll just remind the board members that you're not approving or, or not approving anything. It's you're finding that there is substantial consistency with the master plan or not substantial consistency with the master plan. If you feel it necessary, you, you can also make comments. And, you know, I just went back just to kind of familiarize myself with it um, uh, or re-familiarize myself. But for the board's edification, there is a New Jersey Supreme Court decision that talks about what substantial consistency is. And it's the um, Manalpin Realty, the uh, Township Committee case, and it's a Supreme Court case from 1995. And essentially what it says is there could be some inconsistency with the master plan, but to find that there is substantial consistency, um, you have to show that the, or you have to find that the proposed ordinance does not, and this is a quote from the case, substantially or materially undermine or distort the basic provisions and objectives of the master plan. So if you find that the proposed ordinance does not do that, you can vote that uh, there is substantial consistency with the master plan. And I would leave it to our board's planner, you know, to offer his opinion as to, you know, uh, the issue of substantial consistency. Sure. Um... Yeah, um, I you know agree with everything that Ron said, and with respect to ordinance uh, zero twenty eighteen, it's essentially an ordinance that adds a definition for assisted living facility and craft uh, distillery to the uh, existing ordinance. Um, this ordinance, as well as the other ones tonight, which uh, you know comment on as as we go, uh, they're the result of a detailed, um, transparent planning process that began with the. Um, meetings of the master plan subcommittee with respect to the master plan reexamination report and the land use plan amendment. Um, those meetings were publicly noticed. They, um, there were new, numerous meetings, at least five, um, if not more. And, um, you know, at each of those meetings, each of the recommendations within those two studies or those two reports were discussed in detail. And um, subsequent to the, the conclusion of those meetings, the uh, master plan reexamination report and the land use plan amendment they were both uh, heard at a publicly noticed hearing before the planning board, discussed before the planning board, and approved. And those are the 2019 reexamination report and the um, 2019 land use plan amendment. With respect to these definitions, the craft distillery definition is actually mentioned um, in several places in both reports. And this definition is is precisely consistent with what is is recommended within um, both the master plan reexamination report and the land use plan amendment. The assisted living facility definition is not mentioned in there. However, it's essentially um, adding a definition for a commonly um, known and found use throughout the state in order to update the overall ordinance. I, I you know, as a professional planner, um, in my view, that is a, a good practice. It's in accordance with best planning practices, and it is not inconsistent with the master plan. And based upon that, I, I would find and, and recommend that um, well, it's my professional opinion that both of these uh, definitions are consistent with the master plan. Substantially consistent. Substantially consistent. Thank you, Ron. So is there any, any questions, comments from anybody else on the board? Yeah, Nick, I have a question. The, the um, council meeting that happened a couple weeks ago that the, the th we got a 3-2 vote uh, in favor of changing um, Yellowbrook Road, a couple of these AR twos, and that's part of this. That's part of this, correct? Well, it, let, let's get there. This is not part of this ordinance. Okay, so this this is before that. Yeah, there's there's four ordinances on the agenda. That's one of them, but not this one. Okay. I, I have a question too. Um, 
when, when was the last meeting for the master plan subcommittee? Did we even have one in 2020? There was um, no master plan subcommittees in 2020. There was no subcommittee even appointed in 2020. But the report was approved in 2019, not 20. Right, right. I just like 2020 is such a game changing year. Um, I got a little bit of it. Yeah, just to, just, to, just in case it helps, um, you know, for the for the record, the the meetings in 2019 that that led up to the adoption of the master plan re-exam and the um, the land use plan amendment, it was all pre-COVID. They were publicly noticed, um, you know, and they were they were, uh, I, like I said, I think there were at least five, if not I, around eight, I would say, um, meetings. So there were there were sub, several of them, and um, yeah, there was it was a completely transparent process. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Ron, does question does the public get to comment on any of? These? There's there's no uh, uh, public uh, requirement. You can do it if you want, but there's not a statutory requirement. Okay. Um, being being that, I, I will certainly open up if there's anyone that has comment from the. Hold on. Yeah. We have a couple people want to ask questions. Anyone that comes in and asks questions needs to have audio and video. You will need to be sworn and give your name and address. I have Joan Osborne here. Yes, I'm here. You need to have video. Uh, I don't know if I can do that, but I'm gonna try. There you go. Okay. Just let me just swear you in for us. Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give this board the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? No. Please state and spell your name and give us your address. Uh, Joan Osborne. I prefer not to give my address. Um, I live in Howell. Well, I know at the council they're not requiring that anymore. One of the issues for us is we determine who are interested parties or not. Mr. Chairman, I, I leave it to you, but I can tell you for development applications, it's not going to that's not the law. So, you know, if, if you're satisfied, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, sit on the Environmental Commission with Joan, so I know where she lives, but in past minutes as well, so we can certainly find out. Yeah, go ahead. My, my only comment is on the, um, the issue of the approvals of the zoning changes. Uh, you well, know, that's not, that's well, not this, what we're doing. We're, we're taking oh, and I understand, and I, and I understand you're talking about the first ordinance. It, it's just pertaining to the comments on substantial compliance with the existing ordinance and the um, subcommittee approval process mm -hmm. and the public notice of those meetings and the ability of the public to participate. Um, I attended at least one of those meetings and there really was no ability for the public to participate in the subcommittee meetings. And, and I just wanted that to be clear for the record. Um, and when these changes were passed, uh, I believe it was um, at the end of December last year, at the end of a late meeting, and um, you know th there were comments made requesting that there be additional um, review of the proposed changes uh, before, and, and there were consideration of possibly reserving on it because of the warehouse issues. And I, I would just bring that up that, you know, maybe you should look at this again uh, with regard to the warehouse issues because we're really getting slammed. Well, again, that's not what this ordinance is about. So when we come up to the relevant ordinance, you can certainly make that comment, but it's not relevant to, to this ordinance. Now, I, I will just leave it. Uh, you could put it in the record that, that it would be the same comment I would have for each of these. Thank you. 
Do you have any else, uh, Eileen? Yes, I have someone else. Hold on one second. Takes a little switching around, so you could give me a minute. Sure. I, I had another question too, uh, if I may. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, if this was reviewed in 2019, why why the timing? Why now? Why late 2020? Yeah. We're not the governing body, so you know we we take it as it's given to us. We're not the body that adopted it on first reading. So, you know, it's not, uh, you know, an answer that we can give really. We have Tina Smilek in the audience. Tina, you, know, you have to go off of mute. Hold on. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state and spell your name for the record and give us your address. Tina Smilek, 33 Charles Street, Howell, New Jersey. Okay, go ahead. Um, what, what, what is, what's being changed in these definitions? What's the difference between the previous one and this one? In both these cases, there, there were no previous definitions. These are brand new definitions. Okay, so these are two, these are two new definitions. So we're adding, this doesn't only clarify what these are it clarify it, it's adding them to our zoning which we know where we don't have right now it yeah it's adding brand new definitions to the zoning ordinance well just to be clear peter though it's not adding new uses it's adding definitions to existing permitting you permitted uses that did not exist in the ordinance previously right that's correct okay but the okay, uses but were always permitted do the do changing these definitions change the definitions for the other, for other zoning areas? Well, the answer is no. I mean, the, the issue was there was no definition. So if this was listed as a permitted use, it lacked a definition. So what it does is rather than boards having to interpret what it means, there's now a plain language definition. So it doesn't change the permitted uses anywhere, but what it does is it more particularly you know, lays out what the use means and it takes the, you know, the interpretation out of the process. So what is the definition? Because us as residents do not get to see what you guys are seeing. What is the current rest definition that you're presenting? Peter, you wanna do that? Sure. Um, yeah, so the definition for assisted living facility <clears throat> is facilities that include continuum of care services that include independent living, assisted living, and acute care beds, and the accessory uses that are customarily incidental to and located on the same lot as the principal use. Such accessory uses shall be for the exclusive use of residents and their guests and the staff of the facility. And then the second definition for craft distillery is a facility holding a limited license for the production of alcoholic beverages by the state of New Jersey, where the distilling of liquors is performed a, such a facility shall follow the provisions set forth in NJSA 33 colon 1 through 10, uh, subsection 3A through C. Okay, thank you. And just in terms of the availability, Eileen, I think on the township's website, there was an agenda that had uh, links to the ordinances, correct? Yes. Okay. They have links right. to the ordinances? And they were also posted on the bulletin board when the council had their meeting. Yeah, but we're not allowed into the building. Right, but the but in meeting. terms of what you have easier access to, they, there were uh, links on the actual agenda if you went and, and in the future, you know, for things that are the board is considering, it's, that's the common practice. Okay, I'll go look, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tina. Is there anybody else, Eileen? I have no one else. Okay, then we would just need a motion that uh, proposed ordinance 0-20-18 is substantially consistent with the master plan. We have a motion. So moved. And that second. Was second. Mr. Nicastro with a second by. You can give it to Evelyn. Thank you. 
Roll call. Mr. Dorado? No. Mr. Husser? Yes. Mr. Leggio? No. Mr. Nicastro? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. Deputy Mayor, oh, excuse me, Mr. Everett? No. I'm sorry, what was that, Dave? No. Deputy Mayor O'Donnell? Yes. And Chairman Tannenhaus? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the, uh, the next correspondence is for ordinance 0-20-19, which is to amend chapter 188-77 entitled Highway Development One. Um, Peter, do you wanna take the floor on this one? Sure. Um, you know what, hold did I, go ahead. I, sure, I, yeah. You, you want me to start? You would. Okay. So this ordinance 0-20-19 um, adds two new permitted uses to the, two new principal uses to the HD1 zone, highway development one zone. The uses are of course um, the craft distillery and assisted living facilities. Both of those uses were of course the, the definitions in ordinance 0-20-18 that we had just discussed. The Recommendation here uh, came out of the same process that I had referenced previously in my testimony about Ordinance 0-20-18 with respect to um, this recommendation coming out of the Master Plan uh, Reexamination and Land Use Plan Amendment process. This um, ordinance, uh, particularly the craft distillery, was referenced specifically in uh, both the Master Plan Reexam, 2019 Master Plan Reexam, and the 2019 Land Use Plan Amendment uh, element Amendment. And um, the assisted living facilities, um, again, since it wasn't referenced in those documents, it was added in as a definition. Now it's added in as a use in this zone. Um, you know, for the same reasons stated uh, previously, I think both of these definitions, one literally is recommended, recommended in both the master plan exam and the land use plan amendment. The other I think is, um, is a, simply an updating of, of the ordinance and an updating of this zone to reflect uh, a, a suitable use for the zone. It is a, a highway commercial zone. So um, in my opinion, uh, this ordinance amendment is substantially consistent with the master plan. So Peter, just before we go on then, the question that I asked you with regard to the definitions, I think you need to revise your answer a little bit that, um, I mean, craft distilleries and assisted living were permitted uses in many zones, but they are being added as a new use in the HD1 zone. That's correct. Yeah, because I think you said before that um, it lacked definition, but we weren't changing the zoning, but they existed in other zones without a definition. So we brought a definition to those uh, zones, but we are adding it to this zone where it did not previously exist as permitted uses. That's correct. All right. Chairman, mm -hmm. I got a question. HD1 Peter is Route 9? It is. And we already have a, like assistant living on Route 9 as in the form of brandy wine? That's correct. Okay. Any, any comments? Peter, uh, this, Peter, as far as the HD, is, uh, is this only for HD1 or is this going to be for anywhere in the town? It's only for H HD1. This one. This it's only for HD1. Well, Peter, I think, though, you know, the more complete answer is the definitions that you that were just um, part of the previous ordinance, those definitions apply to these uses, no matter what zone they are in. This ordinance, however, makes those two uses permitted uses in the HD1 zone where they didn't previously exist. But if you are a craft distillery, or an assisted living facility anywhere in town, you are subject to those two new definitions. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Peter, Peter, that's the problem that I have, why I voted no on the last, on the first one. I don't want these, these coming up, popping up all over town. Okay. But they're popping up on HD1 zones, Route 9, correct, Peter? That, that's correct, yeah. This, this Ordinance is, um, I mean, this is this is this changes specifically for the HD one ordinance, and um, I'm not sure that craft distilleries are permitted in many other other zones throughout the, the town. Well, we need we need to make sure where they're permitted. 
I don't have a problem with the craft distilleries or the assistant living is going on HD one. That's fine. That's all I'm asking, Peter. I'm you know, I mean, I'm not trying to. Yeah, no, I, I, you know I, mean? I just want to, I just want a clear understanding. I don't have an issue like Mr. Nicastro on route nine HD one, or if it's route 33, if that's considered HD one. Okay. Is, no, is, route 33 is considered HD three. That's a three. Okay. So if this is only for HD one, for assistant living and for and for to still um, these craft this craft uh, situation, then I want we need it to be worded that way. I don't yeah. uh, you don't want this popping up, you know, two two months from now, and they they want to put one on five forty seven, you know, off of Southern Avenue or you know, down by the well, high John, school. John, if that was the case, they would have to go to the zoning board. Well, yeah. or use variance. Correct. And well, if that's the case, uh, Mr. Castro, then why did the council last week vote to change Yellow Brook Road? If those, if those I'm not people, on Yellow Brook, and I can't answer that question for you, but I would just well, talking about HD. I right now. Yeah. Well, this is this is the issue we have. A couple of us, not all of us, a couple of us have this issue. So the the council last week voted three to two to switch Yellow Brook Road for a couple pieces of property over to an SD, SD light, which is going to be coming up on the next, or, you know, one of these ordinance. Now, if they want, if those home, if those property owners wanted it switched, how come they didn't go to zoning? How come they didn't go to land use? Why is the council overriding all this? Hey, John, John, just, all right, we'll, we'll get to that point when we get to that ordinance. Yeah, well, I'm just, I understand. Nick, I'm just wondering here, I if I vote yes here, that it's HD1 only. I have no problem with it. And that's exactly how it reads, John. Yeah, and <laughs> just just in, in case it helps, I did a, a search of the ordinance online, and my understanding is this: the HD one would be the, the only zone that permits distilleries based on that ordinance search. So um, it would it would just be limited to, to Route Nine in, in this case. Okay, I, I have a I have a bigger issue, more like on a macro side, that the fact that this has been been done, this everything it said is done pre COVID. I mean, we're going to be approving craft distilleries that probably can't open. And then we're gonna also be approving for assisted care facilities that had a horrible issue during COVID. I mean, that's that that's the problem I'm gonna have with all these ordinances. I understand that everything was transparent, but it was this was done pre-COVID. It's, it's a much different climate than in 2020 than it was in 2019. And as, and as far as the master plan, when I was sworn into the planning board, um, I remember Arlene was trying to organize a committee to meet on the master plan to review a bunch of these you know issues. And I guess you know with the COVID and everything else that went on, we didn't get a, a committee together, which is understandable. But I think moving forward, you know, we, we need our chair or vice chair to maybe get everyone together, form this committee, to look at this master plan before making ma these major decisions on, on, on these big change on these changes. So that's my opinion. Mr. Cucci, Hi. Mr. Cuchero and, and, and Mr. Cuchero and uh, Peter. I think I think we need a little lesson 101 on how the oh how these things come about because Mr. Dorado made a statement that there should be no additional development on Route 9 in any way, shape, or form. Somehow COVID has limited the ability to have distilleries and assisted living facilities. And frankly, I don't, I don't agree with that statement. I think it's- I didn't say any development on Route 9, but he said specifically that's craft exactly, distilleries that's exactly, in that's, that's exactly what you said, because how could you say that a distillery and an assisted living facility on Route 9 is not an applicable use on Route 9? On Route 9. We in, 29, have in 2019, it might have been. You think in 2020 it is? It's, it's We're 20, going to prove it's something. It's going, to, it's going to prove, yeah. yeah. How, many, how, many new, how many new establishments are being built now with everything? They're not doing anything right now. Yeah, but the problem is, is if we don't have the uses available and one comes around, they won't come. Or they'll go to the zoning board and they'll have all those. Can, 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 I, 
So can I can I speak to the zoning board issue? Yeah, let's have 101. Let's have 101. Yeah, because that's not the way that planning is supposed to work. So right. the way that the process that the municipal land use law lays out and the process that has been announced in our courts is that zoning is supposed to be done through varying uh, through ordinance, not variance. You're not supposed to take it sort of in a ad hoc basis and determine on individual uh, basis what's going to go in a particular zone. What is, determines what should go in a zone is your master plan. Your master plan serves as a policy document which guides development in the municipality. And that's exactly why the municipal land use law requires that these ordinances be referred to you. And in fact, there's different voting requirements for the governing body depending upon how you vote. If you vote that it is substantially consistent, then a majority of whoever happens to be at a governing body meeting can adopt the, uh, the ordinance. If you find that it is not substantially consistent, then it has to be approved by a majority of the full authorized membership, no matter how many people are there. So if three are there, it would require three. If four are there, it would still require three. Uh, rather than a mere uh, majority. But what the courts say is that for non-inherently beneficial uses, which both of the, well, uh, the distillery certainly uh, is not an inherently beneficial use, you're not supposed to take them by use variance. Um, you're supposed to, if you want them to adopt an ordinance and you adopt standards that are gonna be followed. The case law is very clear that use variances for non-inherently beneficial uses are to be granted, they use the word sparingly. And every single case talks about how, if it's something that you want, you should adopt an ordinance rather than taking it one by one. So merely saying, you know, well, just send them to the zoning board. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Further, when you send them to the zoning board, it, they're not going as a permitted use. They're going for a D1 variance and they have very high burdens of proof that they, that they have to meet. Um, so it's just not the way that the law uh, is, is written. The way, just I guess to briefly summarize, you're supposed to adopt the master plan. The governing body adopts ordinances which are substantially consistent with the master plan. They come back, they are referred back to this board to confirm the substantial consistency. They go back to the governing body for a second reading and a, pub, and a, uh, and a public hearing. But the legislative process, time and time again, statutorily and through case law, that's the way that new uses are supposed to come into municipalities. It downright discourages and, and uh, tells you you cannot just keep granting use variances. Because at some point in time, what you also do is, according to the case law, you usurp the legislative function of the governing body. If you start granting a bunch of use variances for particular uses in a zone, you've defeated the, uh, the zoning, which is adopted through an ordinance. And you've actually taken on a, uh, a role that is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the governing body. So the whole system is set up this way, that there's a legislative way to adopt new, to permit new uses, and you're not supposed to do it you know, uh, via the zoning board process, if you can avoid it. And, and Ron, would it be fair to say that by actually defining where we want these types of uses, which are, are uses that are used in the state of New Jersey elsewhere, if you don't define it, then the developer, if they could prove the appropriate uh, hardship and the variance is, is nece necessary to be granted, they get an opportunity to put it wherever they want in, in Howell. However, if we actually define it and, and say where we want to have it, they really have a real heavy road of where, you know, if they want to put it if it's not on our H1. Well, I, I would say that when, you're, when you are not an inherently beneficial use, you have a substantial burden under the Medici, uh, Medici case, which is a Supreme Court case, you have an exceptionally high burden when a governing body has actually engaged in the legislative process and made a determination as to where in the municipality you should go, because then you are going against 
you know, a, an actual legislative process rather than the absence of a legislative process. So the first is hard. It's exceptionally, it, or it should be exceptionally hard after the legislative process. So Ron, that's, Ron, that goes back to what I just said before about what the council did, you know, at the last meeting by them voting to change those zonings to, to the SED light, the, didn't they just bypass everything you just talked about? No, no, because because the council, it's, it's a two-part, well, actually a three-part process. So they didn't adopt a zoning ordinance. Um, and Peter, just to make sure, that's one of the ordinances we're looking at tonight? It is. Okay, so in order to get the process started, you have to have what's called a first reading or introduction. It's not adopting the ordinance. All it is is saying that, the council intends to hold a future public hearing on it. And what it allows for is that ordinance to be referred to this body for determination. It then goes back to the council and they'll have a second reading and a public hearing and there'll be a vote to adopt it. That vote was not to adopt, it was just to introduce. So okay. the zoning hasn't changed yet. May I? Of course. Um, it, it's interesting that when we did introduce that there would be no votes, the, uh, as he said, the idea of introducing is so that it can be fully vetted publicly uh, at the council level. Although this has been fully vetted with the master plan subcommittee, and although it be 2019, the end of 2019, uh, you're right, COVID came along. However, I don't think that we should put off properly zoning anything because COVID is here. I think that we can safely assume at some point in time, we will be somewhat COVID free without the restrictions that we've have endured. So uh, I don't look at COVID as a reason to deter doing our job at the council level, let alone at the planning board level. So that argument I would find um, empty. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman, I, I have one other thing for Peter. Peter, because sure. I know we're losing focus. Mr. Leggio's focused on SED light, but I want to go back to the HD1 zone for these two specific uses. Um, age restricted. It's my understanding as people age out of their homes, people that live in Howell, they want to stay close to their families. Um, their kids live in Howell or, or, or a nearby town and that these age-restricted homes give the ability to people who can't stay in their home but want independent living um, and still stay by their grandchildren and by their family members. This is why this definition is now being explained as why it is and that we already have them existing already in Howell. Is that correct? That's, that's correct, yeah. It, it helps um, bring existing uses more into conformity and it also helps uh, increase the variety of housing options in the community, which is one of the purposes of the municipal land use law. And Michael Brewies came up because back in, I believe, 2017 is when they started popping up in towns like Belmar and other areas. And this was the new trend and Howell wanting to bring some new types of businesses into, you know, into Howell. The Michael Brewery seems to be like the hottest, you know, or one of the newest things coming out. And again, that's why the Master Plan Subcommittee looked at this use. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, over time, new uses come about. Some uses, I mean, Distilleries have been around for a while, but not as um, as prominently as they are now. And it's, it's so when you have members of the community who say, "Oh, another bank, another CVS, or another Dunkin' Donuts," and the master plan subcommittee and the master plan come up with new uses to recommend for the governing body, this is the process that they go through. Correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Lacastro. Just to just to clarify, you know, I mean, I don't want to go back and forth with you. Okay. I have no issue on Route 9 with these with these changes, okay? So make the record straight. I do have an issue in other parts of town. So whatever way you're gonna spin it, when we get to the next one, you and Evelyn wanna spin it up, whatever you guys wanna do, make it make it seem like the planning board is, is doesn't wanna put this stuff through. Let's clarify the way it's supposed to be clarified. I don't have an Let's issue clarify, with- Clarify, John. John, if you read the ordinance, the ordinance says the two uses are for the HD1 zone. And that's it. You clarify. No more, Peter, no less. Peter clarified it, but before he didn't clarify it, and with the help of Ron, now, now we're okay. So you want to vote on it? No problem. Good. Okay. 
So we're good. Let's move. I will be honest. Um, thank, awesome. thank, thank God Brian's home. Thank you. I'm home. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome, Dick. <laughs> Thanks for going 90 down the parkway, pal. Ah, uh, there you go. I did the speed limit. Don't worry. Okay. Give me a second so I can get the, my, you can keep going. I'm just getting my, my laptop. Uh, I think actually, Mr. Lunch. Chair, we're ready for the, uh, for a motion now as to whether proposed ordinance 0-20-19 is, is or is not substantially consistent with the master plan. And, and Brian, just FYI, yeah. um, I know it's not, Ron said it, it's not by law that we have to open up to the public. I did on the first ordinance. I would recommend doing it just because of the times and I know there's people that are interested in this. Well, it's up to you, Mr. Chairman. Well let, well, let me ask you a question. I think Ron said that at the next reading, at the next reading of this, after we send this back to the council, that's that's the time where the public can have comment on the ordinance, correct? At the council meeting? There's still another yes. opportunity? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's a public hearing. So as many interested parties as want to, you know, participate can participate. And it's, yeah. so it's, it's more it's more global than than we um, than our role because our role is really limited just to substantial consistency, not whether you know it's something right. you want or don't want. Thank you for that clarification. So, with the fact that it's just just to, to determine whether it's substantially consistent, I think that if the public has comment for it, the proper place would be in front of the council where they can have that appropriate spirited debate and actually make a change. You know, maybe something, if, if something's not appropriate or if people, enough people feel that it's something should be changed, that's where it should be changed. So, so I'm not going to open it for public comment for this particular ordinance. I may, I may hold the, uh, that comment for some of these other ordinances. Let's see how they go. So this one in particular, I'll take a motion, please. I'll make a motion that ordinance 0 2019 is substantially um, in keeping with the master plan. Second. Do I have a second? Who was that Roll second? Call, okay, Nick. Hold on. Mr. Dorado? Abstain. Abstain? Yep. Mr. Husser? Yes. Mr. Leggio? Yes. Mr. Nicastro? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. Mr. Everett? Yes. Deputy Mayor O'Donnell? Yes. And Chairman Tannenhaus? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is Ordinance 0 20 20. I guess. Uh, Peter, if you want to sure. introduce that ordinance and explain to everyone what was in that ordinance. Absolutely. Yeah, so the so ordinance 0-20-20 um, establishes a new zone known as the SED Light Zone, Special Economic Development Light Zone. Um, the purpose of the zone, I'll just read it into the record, it's two sentences. Is, uh, the purpose of the SED light zone is to provide for a variety of economic development opportunities in areas of the township where appropriate infrastructure is available, but such industries will have a minimal impact on nearby residential communities. The SED light district allows many of the uses of the SED district, which is an existing district, but removes many of the most intense and disruptive uses, effectively creating a light intensity industrial zone. Representative uses, I don't know if you want me to, I could go through a couple of the uses or you, what I would like you to do is, is, is there a way for you to summarize the, I don't know if you, if you're prepared for it, maybe putting you on the spot, but are you able to, to indicate what is not in this zone that is in the regular SED that it would be considered an in intense and disruptive use? I am. Yes. I, I went through it and um, the uses that were removed um, include leather products uh, manufacture, stone and clay manufacture, and fabricated metal. And then in addition, certain uses are prohibited just to make the, um, the manufacturing uses. And there's, there's a few light manufacturing uses included in the ordinance. Um, none of the ones I just mentioned, of course, but um, ones that are specifically prohibited to really make the point to any 
uh, potential developers. Others, you know, the prohibited uses include asphalt and concrete, um, lumber and wood products, um, sexually oriented businesses, tattoo, body piercing, and fulfillment centers, which is a the most intensive form of a warehouse development. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. So with regard to some of that, I did have a conversation with the township planner, um, Jennifer Beam, and okay. um, I asked her, you know, if, if we had actually a definition for fulfillment center, and I've actually gone through in some of the other municipalities that I represent, you know, um, that didn't have definitions, you know, what is a fulfillment center versus a warehouse versus a distribution center? You know, I think it's a good thing to put it on the prohibited list, but I think that to the extent we do not have a definition for it, we should put a very specific definition in the ordinance as to what a fulfillment center is. Um, also, with regard to the permitted uses, there are some other towns in Monmouth County that have actually taken the position that warehousing and distribution centers are different types of uses. It's not the same use. So um, to the extent that we may need to straighten that out in, uh, you know, from a definition standpoint, I would recommend that also. Uh, furthermore, anything else that's specifically listed as permitted or prohibited, you know, I would just recommend going through to make sure one that we do have a definition and if we don't, we adopt one. And two, if we do have a definition, just making sure that that definition has kept pace with the times and it still says what we as a municipality want it to say and doesn't require any kind of uh, revisions. I think now's the time to do it. You know, it's uh, fortuitous now that we're dealing with, um, you know, a new zone, but it also goes towards what Peter was talking about before, which, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think anyone was talking about like fulfillment centers. Now, you know, our economy is such that, you know, they're, they're coming everywhere. And, you know, it, it's a, it's always a struggle to have your ordinance keep track with technology and to keep track with modern trends and uses, but we have that opportunity now. So I just encourage uh, the town to, uh, to consider that. The only other thing, Peter, I just had one other question um, on subsection C additional requirements okay the first is multi-tenant structures in the sed light zone all structures shall be devoted to a single user what, what does that mean a sing, it's a multi-tenant building what is a single user for a multi-tenant building um so <clears throat> a, a single user i mean i I'm not sure that it's it's defined in here, but my understanding of it is, you know, that would be a, a single operator, although they may have different tenants. Um, let me see here. I think it should be a single user. Now, you know what? Um, I'm sorry. And it's, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so it's multi-tenant structures in the SED light zone period. And then first phrase is all structures shall be devoted to a single user. Provided, however, that in buildings with a gross floor area in excess of 20,000 square feet, comma, the tenant shall be permitted, comma, provided that the minimum tenant space shall not be less than 2,500 square feet. So, the um, question is if it's, if we're beginning with the fact that it's multi tenant, doesn't that mean there's multiple users? Or is it talking about the ownership of the building? Because multi-tenant means it's not single-tenant. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, devoted to a single user. I mean, I think. Well, then I, I guess my, I would also ask or recommend that that be clarified, I you know, by that. in in the ordinance by the council, because I'm not exactly sure what it what it means. Well, hey, Ron, I have a question too. Do, you know, do we really need to create this SED light zone? Did you just, didn't we just say that it would, you know, the, the developer, could, you know, try to get a variance if they, if that's what they really want to do there, you know, so what is the creation of this SED light zone going to really accomplish? You know, you have farms all over the town, AR6, 
you know, so if the council stayed two years from now decided the whole town could change from, you know, to HR1, to HD, whatever that is, for the Route 9 thing. The, SID, you know, the idea of the SED light is a less intense use of, than what is presently capable of going there. Well, the not, idea, re not really the according idea, to Peter. It's not the clear. Idea is to have things zoned where, people, where applicants know where they can go. And when somebody wants to put something in, the path of least resistance is usually their pocketbook. So if there's a place to put something in a town, which creates less havoc on our infrastructure, then hopefully that's where they go. When you put people, when they go to the zoning board and something gets like a, a fulfillment center is like an Amazon, well, you certainly wouldn't want that there. Um, something like that you would want on a major highway, I-95, something of that nature. But the idea is to let people know where they are able to go. And SED light is in fact light, lighter than what is permitted. And in fact, is there presently. So we're trying to lighten that, that particular road as opposed to uh, keep piling it on. I mean, there's some severe uh, uses on that road presently. I think you would agree. This might be a question for Ron or Peter, but I just want to clarify this particular ordinance we're discussing right now, the only function of it is to establish what SED light in fact means. It's the creation Correct. of the definition, not a location of a zoning. Yes, it's this is just establishing what SED light is. That's correct. This, this establishes a new zone and we've yet to establish where that new zone could occur. Right, and, and, and uh, we have comments. Our, our attorney has made some recommendations. Is that a fair statement, Ron? Yes. And, and with that, this is, this is the ability for the board to provide our comments back to the council so they can decide how they want to adjust the ordinance. And Chairman, if I may, just again, to give a little bit more history for some of the members and probably the audience. My understanding is these zones come mm -hmm. out of um, issues that the town has seen in the past. For example, we have seen in the SED zone, like an LNL that was very controversial, that went to the zoning board, that was a very intrusive uh, use in, the, in a specific area. This zone now says from our past, we now know that we want uses that are less intrusive to Howell Township. And I think this is what this zone establishes. Whereas warehouses typically had 5,000 square foot minimum minimal for a single user with a 50,000 square foot, this now lessens that because we're seeing applications coming in for over a million square feet. So you got to understand how these zones get created. It's They're created because of past practices that the town has seen has not worked for the town. And now you're creating zones that make them less intrusive, basically. Is that correct, Pete? That's correct. P Pete, is AR6 lighter than SED as far as for... It, Mr. Leggio, it, you keep, Mr. Leggio, I got to cut you off, my friend. You keep bringing up AR6. We're not talking about the next ordinance. That's the next ordinance. Please just stick to this one, or we're never going to get through this tonight. All right. The next one, you can bring all that stuff up. It's, it's just simply, as a board, do we want to, do we feel that an SED light ordinance and definition of that is, is substantially consistent with the master plan. And our attorney has made some recommendations that in some ways it's not. There's some, some lack of some definitions that need to be clarified. No, I, I, I didn't mean to say it was not substantially consistent. I was just seeking clarity on, you know, on what some of the text was and recommending definitions so that there was no ambiguity in the future. It was, and it, if I meant, you know, if I came off as saying it was, not substantially consistent. It wasn't, I apologize, it wasn't my intent. Thank you for the clarification. Just to, to add to that for the, the purposes of, of the record, um, my my professional opinion, just to kind of conclude, you know, from where I started, is that, you know, since this came out of the same process that I had referenced previously from the 2019 Master Plan Reexamination Report and the 2019 Land Use Plan Amendment, the language in this ordinance was recommended in there. This language is 
essentially virtually verbatim from those documents. So I would find similarly to the way I found the similar, the, um, the previous ordinances, um, that this is also substantially consistent with the master plan. If I may, Chairman, I, I, have, I do have a question though, based on Ron's comment of, you know, the definition of fulfillment center, warehouse, distribution center, different types of uses, multi-tenant structure, single user, all that stuff. How do we vote on that right now without those being clear? Well, actually, um, I'm just reading again the, the uh, multi-tenant. I, I think I understand. Peter, you know, I, I want your opinion on this. Don't defer to me in any manner. So it says multi-tenant structures in the SED zone, light zone, and it looks like a period. So it's looking, it's ending there. So it says all structures shall be devoted to a single user. So I guess it's setting it up in the SED zone that if you're going to be residential, you must be a, it must be just a single, they say single user, but I guess it's, you know, a single tenant, single family, or, you know, whatever. Provided, however, that if the building, uh, that the buildings with a gross floor area in excess of 20,000 square feet, multiple tenants shall be permitted. So it's sounding like if you are less than 20,000 square feet, you must only be single tenanted. If you are above 20,000 square feet, you can be multi-tenanted. And if you are above 20,000 square feet and multi-tenanted, the apartments cannot be less than 2,500 square feet each. Is that, a, is that the reading of it, Peter? I, I would agree with that uh, in, in its entirety. I mean, it's my, my reading of it is, is you know, if it's 20,000 square feet or less, you're basically um, committed to being a single user above that, as, as you had stated, um, I'm in agreement. If with multiple tenants, you have to uh, have a minimum tenant space um, of not less than 2,500 square feet. But when we say single user, we're really saying either a single tenant, a single owner, you know, a, a, a single family, you know, that, that all would fall within single user. I agree. Okay. So I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that brings some uh, lucidity to, to that issue. Now, the other question with regard to the definitions, I think that you know, the board can probably determine that it's substantially consistent or not substantially consistent, but just recommend that, you know, it not be left to discretion as to what those, uh, or, or interpretation in the future as to what these uses mean, that they just be formally, um, you know, defined, but as a general matter, you know, the, the uses themselves, you know, either are or are not substantially consistent. Thank you. Okay. And again, this is gonna be going back to the council with our, with our recommendations. And at that point, the public has an option to further discuss this, this ordinance with the council and provide input and feedback where the council can make additional changes to this, to this ordinance. Is that a fair statement, Mr. Cuchero? That's a fair statement. And, you know, depending upon what the quantum of a change is, sometimes it actually <laughs> requires a reintroduction and a re-referral if uh, the changes, you know, are, are so substantial in nature that they you know, change the fundamentals of what the, you know, original ordinance was. So that would be, you know, we don't know what any changes may be, if there are going to be any changes, but if there are, they'll be guided by, you know, their counsel, uh, their attorney as to whether, you know, they can vote on it that night or whether, you know, they have to send it back with, uh, with provisions. Okay, thank you. All right, does anybody else on the board have any questions or comments? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. I'll second that. And just to clarify that that's that that motion, Mr. Nicastro was with the uh, 
the recommendations of our council about the added definitions that need to be clarified? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, roll call, please. Mr. Dorado? No. Mr. Husser? Yes. Mr. Leggio? No. Mr. Nicastro? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes, as long as the clarifications regarding warehouse distribution, et cetera, are included. Mr. Everett? Yes, agreeing with Rob. Deputy Mayor O'Donnell? Yes. Chairman Tannenhaus? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. The next one that's going to be in the hot seat here is going to be Ordinance 0 20 21. This is for the rezoning of properties designated AR 6 to SED light. Okay. Mr. Bandicoy, do you want to explain the reasoning behind and the rationale behind this ordinance and update? Absolutely. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this ordinance. Mm -hmm is um, to rezone properties designated agricultural rural estate ARE6 to special economic development light, SED light. Um, the, uh, the ordinance essentially, and I'm not sure, I haven't, I haven't counted the, the number of properties, but there's a variety of lots, at least, um, uh, let's see, multiple lots in block 177 and 180, and block 182 as, as identified on the ordinance um, are proposed to be rezoned. Um, from ARE6, as I stated, to SED light, the tract or um, portion of the, um, of the town that's proposed to be rezoned is located south of Route 33, approximately 800 feet south of Route 33, um, along Yellowbrook Road. And um, it continues both sides of Yellowbrook Road southward to where it meets with an existing SED zone. Um, so SED bounds this proposed rezoning to the south to the east is the PRC zone, to the north is the R3, and to the um, northwest and west is the existing uh, ARE6, uh, the remainder of the, uh, that existing zone. Um, reasoning behind this rezoning is that um, the majority of the existing developed uses are uh, light industrial and commercial. Um, there is uh, close proximity to 33, uh, there's an opportunity um, to basically uh, take the SED zone which is located to the south and establish a gradient of land uses where you have the SED zone, which is the most intensive, the SED light, which is less intensive, and then it leads up to the R3, and then 33, 800 feet away, and it reduces the intensity as, as you move um, toward uh, Route 33 and toward that residential zone that fronts on Route 33. Um, this ordinance, again, it, it came out of the same process referenced previously uh, with respect to the 2019 Master Plan Reexamination Report and Land Use Plan Amendment. And um, you know, it's the same lot and blocks that are referenced within that, the same mapping and the same proposed area. Uh, so my, my um, professional opinion is that it is substantially consistent with the Master Plan Reexamination Report and the Land Use Plan Amendment. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Mr. Leggio, now, now, now you can discuss. Listen, this listen, listen Chairman, it, it, my issue is the council stepped in here and they're changing these over to this SED white or whatever, whatever you want to call it. That road is all commercial, 99% of it. You know, as far as what McCastro said before, L&L, for uh, paving, Stavola has been on that road for like 50 years. You have the concrete plant on that road. You have um, Arms Construction has been there for 50 years. That road's commercial. You know what I mean? So like, I just don't understand why the council had to step in to change these zones. If somebody wants to buy that property and change it over to SED Light or SED, they should follow the proper channels. They shouldn't. The, the council shouldn't be making those decisions. I'm concerned. For the future, okay, in other parts of the town that have AR6, AR3, are they going to do the same? 
Are they going to come in and say, you know what, time to change this road over, time to change this road over? And the people, you know, surrounding developments, surrounding businesses in those areas are going to be affected. You know, this one street already has a ton of commercial on it leading out to Route 33, which is a good idea. Access to a main highway, access back to 34 to 18. Okay, this should have been set over here in this area years ago instead of visiting it now. You know, heck, if I had a piece of property on that road that was that was zoned AR, you know, AR six or whatever, now it's going to be SED light. I guess it's I'm going to get a big payday then. If it, you know, that's, that's my concern. So you know, I'm sorry if I upset some people here by asking some rational questions about the future of the town. We have a 55 square miles. And there's a, a Mr. bunch Leggio. of areas. Mr. Leggio, you're not upsetting us. We're, just we're, ask we're me questions. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to get some clarification. You know, if we vote yes on this road, changing over to this SED light, okay, and it's just a recommendation back to the council, like, you, like, 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 like Ron is saying, and what is... Well, why, don't we, why, don't, why, don't we ask, why don't we ask a question of our professionals? why they made why why the change what 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 does this does, what does this do right now you have existing non-conforming properties in the area correct peter that's correct and so and yeah. those and those existing and, and is it fair for me to say as mr leggio pointed out those existing non-conforming properties are what what type of properties we are going to prohibit in an SED light zone, correct? Correct. With respect so to if there's a change, so if there's a change, if there's a change or upgrade that needs to take place on those properties, they they're going to have to bear a burden of proof of why they can't meet the SED light definition anymore. That's correct. Yeah, they would they would have, especially if they're going to expand their operations, they would have to appear before the, uh, the zoning board because of the expansion of an existing non-conforming use. So, so they would not be able to expand their present existing type of construction without proving that they need a variance. That's correct. Um, and, I mean, build, building off of that, it establishes a set of uses that are more compatible with those existing uses that are that are you know been there a long time but um they would be the uses that would be prohibited under this this ordinance also establishes other less intensive uses that would be more compatible than let's say a residential use located next to an asphalt um, operation and, and things like that so it's from a planning perspective the compatibility um is also an, an important aspect of this right so as mr leggio point if i could just reiterate what mr leggio said is this road is already heavily industrial. The problem is we don't want it to have to be really heavy industrial with the with the type of properties, with some of the type of properties that are already there. We like them to be a little bit of a softer industrial type of property, and therefore we're rezoning it as SED light so that it makes yeah, sure that it doesn't stay that way. If so, I may. And yeah. But if you add warehouses, distribution fulfillment some of the things that we talked about this actually going to create much more traffic than the asphalt or, or some well, of the heavy industrial thing well, and that's my concern because that can't handle that traffic yeah fulfillments are 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 prohibited uses well warehouses mm -hmm. are the same principle where they make their money by taking in freight and then pushing it back out and every warehouse wants as many possible trucks to in there. So I don't, I don't know if this is a great area for that. I don't want to say anything for the council, but I think that may be why in the last ordinance, we all made a recommendation that that fulfillment needs to be defined. And that's probably a good start for a reason why, Mr. Well, fulfillment's different than warehouse. Fulfillment actually takes in a product and that's Amazon. Warehouse is they lease spaces to other people and other people have their products in there whether they're industrial or whatever and then they ship them in and out raw materials could be stored there i mean i deal with them on a daily basis just because it's not fulfillment warehouse is the same thing 
it's as many trucks on that road. If you have a lot of trucks mm -hmm. on that road, which definitely can't handle it because Route 33 there is a logistical nightmare, you're going to have a bigger problem than you do now. Well, that, okay. and that's why the definition is important because at the end of the day, you know, a warehouse is what it's going to be defined as. A fulfillment center is what it is going to be defined as. And it's and our recommendation is that it, it should not be based upon, you know, um, what we believe the use is to be. It is they will define what the use is. And then right. And, and, then, and at that council meeting, Mr. Cucero, is where the public can provide the council that advice and those recommendations to further define those uses. But, uh, you know, something that's coming up, come up with previous applications in our discussions, especially mm -hmm. Paul, from you having some background in logistics, I don't know that the Route 33 corridor would be an attractive place for a warehouse anyway. Mr. Chair, if I may, just, just uh, another point, because Mr. Leggio made some good points. It's true Yellow Brook is one of the heaviest traffic roads in Howell Township, which Travola and all the other operations that are there. But what's, what's ironic is, is that this SED light zone now creates warehousing that is less than what's in the SED zones. They're smaller and they're less in size. Clearly some members aren't just reading or doing their homework to understand what this, what this zone is warehousing's creating. Warehousing's the same, creating whether you got four 20,000 square foot warehouses or one, it's moved the same amount of trucks. You don't use warehouses, what do you know? It's it's. It's less intrusive and they're smaller. The question becomes whether the council decides whether they want any more warehousing or not. That should be the subject. But clearly, this zone is creating less intrusive uh, uses that's already existing on Yellow Brook. So, um, John, you got it right. You got Stravoli, you got LNL, you got all these heavy uses. And if I believe, because I read the master plan the examination report, in 1970, this zone was originally SC, uh, industrial use. In 1980s, I believe, and Pete, you could correct me if I'm wrong, it was changed to ARE6. And mm -hmm. although we're in 2020, you know, at some point, whether you think it's too long or should have happened earlier or whatever, that's not really the issue. The issue is we're correcting an issue now. So the question becomes, do you want to correct the issue now or just leave it as it is? Uh, but the to, to your point, Mr. Nicastro, my issue with changing the AR6 to this LED light, we're setting, you were setting ourselves up for the future for, for some bad decisions down the road. This road that's in question could handle this, you know, well, whether it could handle it or not, you know, we have to listen to some traffic guys and we need a light on 33. There's, a, there's issues over there. A lot of residential with the retirement village, villages that, that are going up. So I'm sure those people aren't going to be happy with more warehousing or whatever is going to go in. But that's not for us to say or not. Okay. But I'm worried about other pieces of property in this town on 547 Squonkum Road on, you know, out on the back roads, you know, heading into Jackson that are AR6. Then you're going to hear, here we go, we're going to, you know, pull up a no, warehouse. No, no, that's, that's not fair. That's not fair, Mr. Leggio. And John, Peter. just to your point, see, there's a process. And when the yeah. re-examination, when the master plan subcommittee does these re-examinations, there's a process. They look at things individually and right. then, you know, the transparency is that's when these discussions take place. If that was your, if that statement was true, what you're saying, then they would have did other areas. You know, they, they look at these areas specifically based on the facts. So can that Correct. issue happen down the road? Yes, but there's a process for that. That's mm -hmm. not what that, is that issue at hand now. Yeah. You don't, yeah, know and it's, and, and, know. you don't know what future governing bodies and visions are going to be or future residents' visions are going to be, but you're right. Can it happen? Yes, but that's not what's happening now. That's why there is a process and these re-examinations take place every 10 years or sooner. Well, I understand your point. It's concerning. To the residents in this the hand the is the now. The hand is, they looked at a specific area now, an area of right. Yellowbrook that's heavily industrial, and do they want to make it less industrial and make it more suitable what's surrounding it? But I think one thing we have to be aware of, too, and, you know, Mr. Leggio makes this point, Mr. Dorado does, everybody does. We constantly are talking about warehouses. Uh -huh. But there's 24, I believe, close to 24 permitted other uses in the SED light zone. 
some of which could be quite desirable, especially to the people local to that living in the adult communities to have a new deli or pharmacy or whatever the business may be. I mean, we're pigeonholing holding it to warehouses, which I realize is, is a matter of contention. But I think we also have to look at all the other opportunities as well. No, we're pigeonholing yeah, it to the, to the developers that are going to make the most money on whatever's going to go there. Uh, people aren't going to build stuff that isn't going to make money for them. And we're, and we're not being considerate of, you know, everything that surrounds that area. Have you been over there at rush hour or even before rush hour? It's the, heading out from on to 33 over there. It's, it's, it's crazy. Even Cranberry Road back in the Farmingdale. You know, it's, it's heavily, heavily you know, run by trucks right now. So here we go, SED light and more tractor trailers, <laughs> more traffic. So, you know, I don't live over there, so whatever. I don't agree with this, but, you know, you guys could try to convince me, you know, the other way. I'm only one vote, so. I have a question. Peter, the, the farms that are there are not necessarily working farms as most people I think would uh, think of. For instance, I know the one property uh, is a farm, but it's a Christmas tree farm. Can you identify other things that are not necessarily agricultural farm, well, animal husbandry farming, and uh, you know, it's a business and a farm, you know, a farm, a business farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you have um, different uses, like, like you mentioned, you know, Christmas, Christmas tree farms, you know, animal husbandry. I mean, there's even um, the full range of agricultural and like a, just trying to trying to think here off the top of my head. Um, you have, um, you know, the uses that are, I, I guess, uh, you know, farms with a farm market. Although I think we're getting into a little bit of a, of a different use there. Well, there's, there's the landscaping I know of, and then you've got a kennel. So I mean, although it's ARE six, I mean. These are non-conforming at this point. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and with and I'm sorry, oh. I thought you, I thought you meant with um with respect to, to alternative. No, my point is that there, the, the ARE six, you know, isn't necessarily at this point in time, you know, um, cows and horses. You know, it's it's a working farm, a business farm, um, mm -hmm. which we're thankful to have, obviously, because it's a service to the community. So I think it's important to understand what's actually there, along with that. Um, the, um, I've got a firecracker uh, warehouse at the end there. Yeah, there's some interesting uses. Yeah. There's also a, yeah. a, a kennel, oh. Happy Tales kennel. Um, so there's there's a variety of commercial uses. An interesting mix for sure. So the intent yeah. is we, we'll never have another asphalt plant there because that's been prohibited in the town. However, we're looking not to have the intent uses that we have now. There'll not be another George Harms facility. There'll not be another... Uh, uh, LNL, which was the pipe plant, which was incredibly um, uh, invasive use, you know, very strong, not invasive, very heavy duty use. So the idea is that the uses would be generally less than, and farms are not being pushed out by any stretch. You know, there are, these are working farms, business farms. Well, well, Deputy Mayor, I mean, agriculture, forestry, and agricultural services is one of the prohibited. I mean, uh, the, the uh, one of the allowable principal uses. Yeah, but my, I get, my point is that there's things that are there now that's not necessarily a simple residence. I mean, this is a street mm -hmm. of a multifaceted uses. So the idea right. is to prohibit the very heavy uses mm -hmm. that, that is there. So the and, one fix, the and, fix, and fix existing non-conforming uses. And that would be nice, yeah. Yeah, because that's an incredible amount of non-conforming use. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody else have any comments? Question is, is, is this still conforming, substantially conforming to the master plan? In my opinion, I believe it is, but we'll, we'll open it up. If nobody has any other questions, this one I'll open up for the public. Let's, let's hear the public comments so we can discuss and at least the public can get our opinions from the planning board so that when they bring it to the council, so I'm assuming anybody in the public that's going to have comment is going to actually go to the council meeting, at least they'll be 
maybe better informed or at Ready? least have a better idea of how these things have came about. Please. Please state your name and your address. Speak slowly. Make sure that you have your video on as well. We have Tina Smilik on the line. Thank you. <clears throat> I just need to swear you in again because it's a new uh, matter. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? You're muted. Yes. Yep. Okay, and just give us your uh, your name and address again. Tina Smilek, 33 Charles Street, Howell, New Jersey. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So the current the current area right now is AR6, correct? Correct. Are warehouses allowed in AR ARE6? No, they're not. So by moving this to SED light, you're now allowing a use that's higher than what is actually there. You're not actually saving us. You're causing it to be, you're, you're allowing more uses to it. Leave it ARE6 and you don't ever have to worry about warehouses or anything going there. And there is qualified farms there. I know Deputy Mayor said there's hardly anything there. Like it doesn't matter I, what the farms are. I, I didn't say that. There are qualified farms. Qualified farms. I believe the tree farm is qualified. But that the taxation of that property and how many really acres isn't is relevant. And how many acres is that? I don't have that map in front of me. Perhaps Peter would have it. I don't. I don't have acreage by parcel. But um, the uses that were that are being introduced, there's actually the asphalt plant is probably one of the most intensive uses. The okay, is, but that's not allowed. We we've already prohibited that in town. No more are allowed. So this isn't going to stop it. We have already stopped it by prohibiting it in town. Did we not? Yeah, I mean, the uh, point I'm trying to bring out in, in response to your, your question is that um, the uses that are being introduced are actually less intense than the existing uses. No, um, and ARE6 doesn't allow that. Yeah, but Ms. Smilek, there are existing non-conforming uses that are more, more uh, intense already in those areas. Okay. Do you have any other questions for our professionals? We want yes, to make I sure that everybody what, is properly informed. What, what are we missing here? We are, we, the town has prohibited both, it has prohibited asphalt and those plants in, in all of the town, in any zone. So this isn't prohibiting anything. You're actually making this worse by changing it to an SED. How many people are sitting there on planning board that actually looked at this master plan? How many people are still on planning board that actually voted on it and saw the presentation? Smilek, the, these are things that you can bring to the council. I, I, don't, I don't think that these type of comments and questioning is appropriate for the planning board. We're here Meet to give you information. The board, how much you know about this property before you vote on it is not. Ma'am, I don't think that's an appropriate question. Okay, I'll end it with you this. Know. You're moving from ARE6 to an SED light. That is going backwards with our master plan. It's going backwards and you're going to you're going to hurt this town by pushing this through. So any of you planning board members that decide to vote yes on this, just know you're voting yes to put sending this town down the wrong road. Okay. Ryan, can you can you again explain what the planning board's role in is that we're not introducing an ordinance, we're voting what we're voting on again? You're sitting here saying that an ARE6 zone, an SED zone, is less than an ARE6 zone, and that's not true. Tell the truth. An ARE6 zone, leaving it as is, is less invasive to this town than changing it to an SED light zone. Is that not true? Ron, uh, Ron, and I think our professionals need to provide some comment on that. Do you have any advice on how to respond to that? Well, I can only tell you I can only tell you what the jurisdiction of the of the board is. So the task, the statutory mm -hmm. task of the board is to review the proposed ordinance and determine whether it is substantially consistent with the master plan. And notice so, how my answers aren't getting my questions aren't getting answered. That's because there is no answer. SED light is IRE6. Leave the area alone. Or you know what, Mr. Chairman, how about you appoint some people to the master plan committee that hasn't been done all year? No, by all, by all means, I, by all means, if someone gives me a budget, I'd be happy to do so. 
Well, then let's talk to the council. I'm sure you will have well, full Mr. support Chairman, any resident for the, the redo Mr. our master Chairman, plan. Mr. Chairman, you know? our master plan needs to be taken precedent here. You guys are taking an ordinance or and you're going to pass this ordinance and it's going to make it worse for every yeah, resident Mr. in the Mr. state, Chairman, especially in that area. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, first of all, the planning board does not adopt ordinances. The right. Ordinances, the ordinance has been introduced by the governing body. It has not been adopted. If this, this planning board denies this, it, so Mr. It doesn't Chairman, benefit. Mr. Chairman, I can I can go on mute if if no one wants to listen to me. You know, if anyone wants to listen, I'll speak, but I'm not going to compete. Ms. Milik, how do you want to handle it? Do you want our professional to, to tell you what we can and can't do? Yeah, I'd like to know what can we, how, I want to know how the SED light zone is better than the ARE. Then you got to give them, you, you gotta give them a couple of minutes to, can you, can you give them a couple yep. minutes, please? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's not really question. a matter of what's better or not better. It's a matter of, is this something that is substantially consistent with the master plan? So when you look at the master plan for this area, you look to see, are these the types of uses that the master plan is, is recommending? Is it promoting them? Or is it not the type of uses that are being promoted in the master plan? And I'll just, I'll just bring it out again, what the New Jersey Supreme Court said. And it is, again, it's the uh, Manalpin Real DV Township Committee, 140 NJ 366, it's a 1995 New Jersey Supreme Court case, and it said that what you're looking at is does the proposed ordinance, uh, does it not substantially or materially undermine or distort the basic provisions and objectives of the master plan? So you're looking to see whether the proposed ordinance has that effect on the okay. master plan. What if the planning board disagrees with the master plan? Can they ask to review the master plan or they don't have the that plan, choice? The, the master plan is the planning board's document. It's not the governing body's document. Yes, but the most master of the plan, people on the planning board now I, I, I will, them. Ms. Smilek, I'm trying to answer your questions. So you make statements and some of them are not exactly accurate. I'm trying to you know, place them in their proper context and we can have a discussion about it, but I need to be okay. able to do that. So the master plan under the municipal land use law is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the planning board. So it, it, if the planning, it is the planning board's document. So the planning board, when it adopted it, absolutely agreed with it. And that's also why you have the periodic re-examinations of the master plan you know, to make recommendations as to whether the master plan is still uh, viable, you know, still still current. So if the board wants to change the master plan and if it has the budget to do so, you know, it can engage in that process, but it's not the governing body's document, it's the planning board's document. And that's why there's the referral because it's the planning board's document. Okay, so now can the planning board request that they review the master plan again on this area because they don't agree with the master plan? I mean, what, what happens when the planning board doesn't agree with the master plan? Well, I don't understand. Like the master plan has multiple elements to it. So disagreeing with the master plan is a very general statement. If there's a provision of the master plan, a particular section of the master plan, that the planning board you know wants to amend it certainly has the jurisdiction doesn't need except for you know the budget to do it it doesn't need anybody's permission it can it can undertake that process itself so tonight the map the planning board can request for this ordinance to be reviewed in the master plan before they vote they can i don't understand what that review. means like can, mean, can the planning board ask to review this what this ordinance this part of the master plan that covers this ordinance can they ask to review this and if they want to make changes to the master plan now would they be able to well we only have a specific amount of time to make a uh, to take an action 
after the ordinance is referred to us. And if we don't take any action, then, you know, Wait, we, we so become if irrelevant. So we disagree with this, we still have to go because we're forced now because they, the, the Wait, we're forced to make a decision right now because council introduced this. Well, we're forced, we are given a time frame <laughs> by the municipal land use law in, to review an ordinance. So, you know, and if they don't decide to, to do this today, would they just have to reintroduce the ordinance at a later time? No, they don't. If we don't do anything, then the governing body doesn't have to take what we say into account at all because we didn't say anything. Once that time period passes, you know, there's there's nothing that so, uh, that this board can do. So everybody says here, let's let the council make the decision on this, and let's let the community talk to the council and write this out. How about the planning board right now take a stand and say we're not going to vote on this? We're going to leave this in council's hands. If council wants to do this, it's without our blessing. Can the they municipal, do that? The municipal land use law doesn't. It it the municipal land use law wants this board to. To make a decision it just is not going to wait forever so what you're suggesting is inconsistent with the statutory scheme that's what the legislature has put together not not the governing body i can't recommend as a legal matter that this board not review something and purposefully you know let the time elapse well actually you are because they're not allowed to review it now you're asking them to vote on something that none of them has even looked at or even had that's not Even true. Ms. Milek, Ms. Milek I, I don't appreciate you making an insinuation and no one understands the master plan or understands uh, how this planning board operates. Okay. That's, that's I, I respect fair. that. I was at the master plan meeting. I was actually there that night when you presented this master plan. And I was there and it there seemed to be a lot of questions and it just came to, there was a lot of people absent too. I think you had just had a quorum that night and it was one no and the rest were yes if I recall myself correctly. And you know what, Thank half you. the people sitting in that room right now wasn't, weren't there to see the presentation. I'm just wondering how many of them actually went back and looked at this presentation of what the master plan changes were back in 2019. Well, it doesn't it's matter what the master plan changes were, it matters what the master plan is. So right. when you look at what the master plan is and it either is, in your opinion, substantially consistent or it is not. So, I mean, you're just looking at the so, plain language that exists so in the document. What does a planning board member that disagrees with this do at this time? If a planning yeah. board member disagrees with changing an ARE6 zone to a worse zone of a, of a uh, SED light, what does a planning board member do if they don't agree with the master plan? The planning board, well, by direction to the planning board members with regard to anything is that you follow the municipal land use law and the, right. you follow your oath which is to follow the municipal land use law. So- And, and, the, con and the constitution as well, Ron. Right, well, I mean, but the municipal land use law has the mm -hmm. specifics as to, to what your role is. Um, so, it's in, so I would I say, think, look, you, you, your role is to determine substantial consistency. If you, can, if you wanna make a comment above and beyond that, that you would recommend that the, board, the governing body reconsider, you can certainly do that. But your primary function, and you know, you can't just determine you're not going to, you're not going to undertake what the function is, is to determine substantial consistency. Is it fair to say that it's similar to to acting like a judge? We we have we have rules that we have to abide by, and that's the municipal land use law. What's not I, I mean, you can make whatever Listen. analogy you want. I just look at it as you're on a board. The board mm -hmm. is not, doesn't have the freedom to do whatever it wants. You know, the governing body doesn't even have the ability to adopt ordinances. If the board defer. doesn't have the, if the board doesn't have the option to do what it wants, then what's the point of the board? I mean, could it just the, any person come here and interpret the law and then that's well, it? What I can Basically, tell you, all they need is you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Again. Let me let me just explain to you what what judges look at when they're reviewing mm -hmm. actions of boards. Boards get reversed when they act in a manner which is uh, quote arbitrary, unreasonable, and capricious. If I were to define what when the courts define what arbitrary, unreasonable, and capricious is, it's you do whatever you want 
despite what the law says. So, I mean, if that's the way you want your board to operate, you're free to do it, I suppose. But when you lose in court and you lose every single time because you've made a determination that on a case by case basis, you will apply whatever rules you think are appropriate in that instance, rather than applying the statutory standards, which have been adopted by the New Jersey Assembly, the New Jersey Senate and signed by the governor, you're so well beyond and a court could actually remove you as a planning board member because you've actually said to the court, I refuse to comply with my oath of office. Thank you. So the oath so, of office so says Tyler, that you're not allowed to have your own opinion on it. You just have to follow whatever's there. You have to follow so the law. Yes. Your oath of office says mm -hmm. that you have to follow the law. So that I would agree with you, Ms. Smiler. Ms. Smiler, do you have any other questions or comments that we could share? with our professional i would ask that the planning board just ask to re-examine this master plan and not be comfortable with settling now if we push this back a month or two and have it reintroduced it's no big deal if it's meant to be then every planning board member in there should be okay with pushing it off a month or two to re just to see that are moving an are six zone to an sed one light zone was not incorrect back in the last planning back in 2019 with which uh, the master plan committees cons consisted of three people. And we, we will we will take that into account. <laughs> and it was reviewed by the whole it was reviewed by the whole planning board. There was a hearing at the planning board. Yes, and only Not five just people showed up. There wasn't even everybody there. It, it was gets that voted night, by the whole planning board. It, it wasn't the whole Thank planning you. board. There was five <laughs> people there, and at that night, it was right after we got done with the warehouse presentation for Randolph Road. So it which was happened really to be one night. of the. Busiest I meetings the in, in the town. And most people okay. left, but they didn't know. Miss Mr. So. Nicastro, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna move on. Miss Smilek has has okay. said what she wants to say. We've you. taken her advice. We appreciate it. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak? Yes, I have two others. One moment. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> are, are they are they here Eileen yeah we have Joan Osborne but I don't see her I promoted her there she is okay let me just swear you in again do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give this board to the truth the whole truth nothing but the truth You're muted, Ms. Osborne. Is it working now? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I, I do swear and affirm. All right. So just uh, state and spell your name for the record. Joan Osborne, O-S-B-O-R-N-E. Um, I just had a couple quick points I wanted to, to address uh, with regard to the change. Um, it's my understanding, based on what I've been hearing, that the planning board is being asked to determine if the zone, um, if this new zone is consistent with the intent of the master plan. Um, the master plan currently has this area listed as an ARA, ARE6 zone, uh, which allows for certain uses. Um, the testimony and the comments that I've heard from the various members and from the professionals is that it would be consistent with the master plan to create this new zone for this area. But um, the problem I'm having with it is the testimony is that it's consistent because of existing non-conforming uses rather than it's consistent with the master plan intent, uh, which has a different set of uses for that area. So now you're trying to basically say, well, because all these other things are there, then it would be okay to change this and make it consistent with these non-conforming uses. And you're looking at two different things. Uh, you know, if you want to say it's consistent with the master plan, you should be referring to the master plan and the, the uses that are permitted and that would be permitted under this new zone rather than pointing at the existing uses. Because hopefully, I mean, I think the intent is that those non-conforming uses would eventually disappear. 
not to say, okay, let's let's meet those uses and intensify the use so that it's consistent with this uh, change that we're making. Um, the other issues that I have is that you are you need to consider what's already been approved in the area for that location. Um, you've got a bunch of senior housing developments. I think 300 units are being built across Route 33. You're going to have a bunch of a, a lot more traffic because of that. Um, you you have a, a lot of traffic on Route 33 as it is. We have warehouses that are being proposed, and I believe only two weeks ago approved by the Board of Adjustment for Fairfield Road near Route 33. Um, it's going to have 78 loading bays. Uh, you have no ability once the zone is created to look at the traffic impacts except for on-site traffic of a proposed development. So when, when you include in this new SED light zone, the ability to have a warehouse, you're, you're gonna be throwing a bunch of traffic onto our roads and you will not be able to say, we cannot approve this use um, because it's consistent with the zone we created. So you're kind of tying your hands by allowing the word warehouse to be in this ordinance. Um, you're tying your hands and you're, gonna be, you're not gonna be able to say no to anybody who comes in an SED light zone and says, I wanna do a warehouse. And if you wanna have a semantic question about, oh, is it a fulfillment center or is it a warehouse? You know there's gonna be a lot of litigation about what is what, and there's not gonna be enough of a difference for it to really be a valid distinction that would allow you to hang your hat and say, no, we, we're gonna to have to deny this application because it's a fulfillment center versus it's a warehouse. So, you know, I just wish that you would really be mindful of the potential traffic impacts that you're not going to have any ability to do anything about if you leave the word warehouse in this proposed zone. Mr. Chair, could I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, if, if the governing body decided that they wanted to remove this specific use, because all I keep hearing is warehousing, warehousing. If the governing body decided that they wanted to remove warehousing out of the SED light, does that fall under their, uh, you know, their jurisdiction, their right to do? Yes. So if the people go to the governing body and say the concern is warehousing and SED light, they could literally remove that use from that permit, you know, that permitted use in that zone. And it has no bearing on us finding it consistent with the master plan. It's two different, it's apples and oranges, correct? Yeah, just because something is substantially, finding that it is substantially consistent is not, you know, tantamount to it being approved. It's just, it gets you to the public hearing and the governing body will make that decision. So finding that it is substantially consistent doesn't prohibit the governing body from, you know, amending that ordinance to remove warehouses at permitted use. Correct. And, and one of the reasons why the planning board has a class one and a class three, two members of the governing body, is that they could hear these types of concerns and bring it back to the governing body as a whole, and they can make that determination at that time, correct? Yeah, there's a, the municipal land use law contemplates, you know, a, a synergy between the governing body and, and the planning board. And, you know, in our form of government, we're actually just one council member short of a quorum here on the uh, on the planning board if i if i might i, I there must be and mr cochero you can tell me there must be some impact for having the planning board render the decision that it is not in substantial yeah i i discussed plan. that i discussed it earlier the voting requirement is different so if you find that something is substantially consistent then it's just a simple majority to adopt an ordinance if you find that something is not substantially consistent, then it's they need a full, a, a majority of the full authorized membership, which is three. So for instance, if you only had three that come to a meeting, which is a quorum, you would need all three to vote yes if um, you know there was a determination that it was not substantially consistent, as opposed to if you did vote it was substantially consistent, you would need two of the three.
So I would suggest to you then that, you know, given that it does include the word warehouse as currently posed, that I don't see how you can vote that it is substantially consistent with the intent of the zoning, which currently doesn't allow for it. The intent of the master plan, not the zoning. Right, correct. Thank you. Any other further comments? Ms. Osborne, uh, thank yeah. you. Do you have any further comments? Okay. Nothing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Eileen, can yes, you I please one. tell us who else we have on from the public? I have someone that just has their initials SSH. I just brought them into the meeting. Please state your name and your address. Okay, just a second. I'm just trying to get the video up here. Um, I don't know why it's not starting the video for me. For some reason, it's saying my camera's powered on, not powered on. Um, I, I don't not, know. If well, a before you start, we have to swear you in, and, and I'm not sure that based upon the, the state's latest guidelines on on these type of public formats on electronic on the electronic side you have to have video is that a fair statement uh, the uh <laughs> there's some sloppiness to how the emergency regulations have been drafted and it's being addressed in the uh, public hearing process for the permanent rule adoption the way the emergency rules were adopted it really it addressed developers who were providing sworn mm -hmm. testimony and it it, it treated members of the public who were going to comment or or ask questions differently. So there's okay. some flexibility for members of the public versus developers. Um, so I think, you know, for, for this purpose. We don't have video for this. We'd be okay considering that she tried and it just wasn't the, able to work. The, it, the the language as it currently exists i think can allow for this okay let's please swear swear her in thank you well i just connected oh can you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth the whole truth nothing but the truth they're Oops. muted for some ah. Yeah. I do. I just connected through my phone, which might be able to give the video. All right. We'll give you a few moments. All right. So I raised my hand. You're Sheila H. I am. All right. Hold on. I have to bring you into the meeting because you're logged in separately that way. There you go. There you go. Okay, so let's do this again. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, the audio is off on the on that phone connection. You know. Hold on. I mean, is it on your end? Not yet. I hear you. We have no voice from you. We need some. Yes, you're okay. So if I, if you get my, okay, you can get my video through the phone and the audio through the computer. Okay, we have you. 
All right, okay. so let's swear you in. Yeah. Swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Please state and spell your name and give us your address. Uh, my name is Sheila Hatami, H A T A M I. Um, and I'm here representing my parents, Ann and Siavash Hatami, and also uh, Siacom LLC, which is run uh, by my father. Uh, they reside at 37 Yellowbrook Road. We also own 20 Yellowbrook Road, 28 Yellowbrook Road, and 6 Yellowbrook Road. Um, my parents moved here in 1974. They have been on this road since 1974. Um, at that time, my father moved here, started his landscaping business, and, um, you know, we have purchased property along the way. We are one of the working farms on the road. There are several working farms on the road, um, and uh, what we're talking about rezoning here is not the industrial area, but the agricultural area, um, and so, uh, our position is that um, this ordinance as written is not substantially uh, consistent with the master plan um, and instead substantially and materially undermines and distorts the basic of objectives of the master plan. Um, it does not retain open space or appropriate development. We're going from ARE6, which is six acre subdivisions to um, uh, two, under two acre subdivisions with 70% lot coverage. There are 13 property owners in the zone. We of course own several parcels. We did not have any opportunity to um, participate in the planning process with regard to this uh, zone, even as a courtesy um, until of course it was introduced to the council. Um, this is a heavy intensification of the use um, it does not comport with the master plan because Howell has chosen residences and residential uses in the area. It abuts the R3 zone. Um, Equestra runs the length of the properties in back of uh, block 177 out to Cranberry Road. Uh, the planning board has approved, this board has approved 70 plus residences to be um, a, a, a use for the property at the end of Yellowbrook Road and 524. Uh, there's the KHAV development uh, up Route 33 with 100 plus units and the Toll Brothers development with another 100 plus units, all age restricted homes. You have a lot of um, elderly and seniors using these roads. Um, the uh, ordinance is not narrowly tailored to comport with the character of the area and the goals of the master plan. Um, as, uh, Deputy Mayor O'Donnell uh, said that there are uh, multifaceted uses along this particular parcel uh, or uh, proposed zone. Um, it has residences, small businesses, landscapers, a tree removal company, and several farms. Um, the proposed zone does not include the, man the fireworks manufacturer, as uh, someone previously stated. Um, the ordinance as proposed, the SED light zone does not include uh, landscaping businesses and trade contractors. Um, one of the individuals in the zone has gone before the zoning board to seek a variance uh, and he will not get relief from the change in zone. Um, uh, also, um, We'd like to see uh, some uh, multi-uses on these large parcels. Most of the par parcels are over 10 acres, some are 20. Um, I would like to see some uh, multi multiple uses uh, being permitted um, on these parcels. Right now, um, as it stands, if this is rezoned SED light, all of the residences there um, will not be in conformity with the zone. Um, and for that reason, we'd like to see an overlay um, in this area. Uh, in the master plan um, and the land use amendment, it says that the SED light zone along Yellowbrook Road will, quote, remove residentially zoned properties that are being impacted by surrounding industrial uses. But as I stated previously, this abuts an R3 zone and Equestra. These residences are not being removed or included in the industrial zone. 
Um, as one of the board members uh, stated, there's insufficient infrastructure. Um, I don't know why or if Howell has ever examined um, a direct route along the railroad tracks into the industrial zone. There's no direct route into the industrial zone here. It would have to go through a residential area. Um, and that trucks can't get in and out efficiently. And that problem really needs to be addressed. And as I stated, there's a lot of elderly and um, uh, uh, older folks driving these roads. The trucks are very difficult to, to navigate with them on the roads. Um, uh, also, um, some trucks uh, and some traffic goes out to the uh, light at Colts Neck Road. There's sufficient backup along Route 33. Uh, oftentimes, I'm getting in there, and um, uh, the, the traffic from that light is backed up past Yellowbrook. If there is uh, more traffic in and there, out of there, there's going to be a significantly more backup. Um, there are uh, still vacant lots in the SED zone. Howell should encourage that build out first in accordance with the master plan. Um, and the light zone doesn't specifically exclude uses permitted in the SED zone. For example, it doesn't state that it doesn't permit um, uh, construction uses or explosives manufacturing. The, as as uh, I think the attorney stated, um, the definitions um, could be fleshed out uh, and should be fleshed out for the zone. Um, the final uh, item that I think is not in compliance with the master plan, again, this is an agricultural zone um, with a lot of buffers between the properties. And this zone should look at appropriate uh, buffers and setbacks for the uses proposed. Um, so I would recommend that the, the planning board find that the, the ordinance as drafted is not uh, substantially compliant and substantially consistent with the master plan. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions that the planning board members may have about uh, the uses in the zone. I'm, like I said, we've been there a long time. Mr. McCastro, you look like you got a question. No. Does anybody have any questions? Do any of our professionals want to address any of the concerns of the citizen? Um, I mean, if I could, I could respond. There was a, there was multiple, multiple points there, though. Um, so I don't know. I probably need something in, in writing to really provide a comprehensive response. But um, there is a 50-foot perimeter buffer that will be required for um, any use. I believe it's over, over an acre. Any commercial use. Um, I mean, a, a lot of it. I'd be reiterating a lot of the testimony that I already put on. But essentially, um, you know, we're trying to create a. a I guess the ordinance is essentially designed to create a, um, a district that is less intensive than the most intensive uses in that zone. Um, there's close proximity to Route 33, and there's a that would also establish a gradient of of uses from the existing SCD toward Route 33. Um, beyond that, I mean, I would need to review something to respond to a lot of the specific points. Well, Peter, I think there's one overriding point and the one point that I think is the most relevant to this board and the point that we started with. I mean, you heard the, the comments from the members of the public. Does it change your opinion that the master plan is substantially consistent or that the proposed ordinance is substantially consistent with the master plan? Is your opinion changed by anything that you have heard? It, it is not. Um, the, yeah, the, uh, the proposed rezoning remains substantially consistent with the master plan. It is uh, reflected in both the 2019 reexamination report and the uh, 2019 land use plan element. So let's just talk about that then for a second, because the, the statements were that this is not found anywhere in the master plan. <coughs> Excuse me. You're saying that it's in the land use element. 
So can you call out for us where in the land use element this is? Yes. Um, so this ordinance, um, the recommendations, the actual block and lots and the, the same, the same uh, rezone recommendation that is in the ordinance before us is uh, referenced on page 52 of the master plan reexamination report and uh, pages 21 and 22 of the land use plan amendment. All right, so the land use plan element, which is an element of our municipal master plan on the pages that you referenced, you're, you're telling, telling us those pages specifically recommend the proposed uses that are contained in the proposed resolution. They, they recommend the rezoning of the lots under consideration of this ordinance into the SED light zone. And the uses are actually also also referenced in the master plan as stated previously tonight in testimony for a previous ordinance. Um, they are denoted on pages 44 and 46 of the master plan reexamination and uh, pages 13 through 16 of the land use plan. All right, so then just so that I'm clear, and I think it would help the board and members of the public, the current land use element of the master plan calls out these specific lots for rezoning to SED light and further the land use element on the pages that you have referenced lists the specific permitted uses that are part of this ordinance. Yes, the 2019 land use plan amendment references both these uses and these lots on the page. And, and that, you know, that forms the basis, I assume, of your testimony tonight that it, the proposed ordinance is substantially consistent with the master plan. That's correct. All right. Now, as you stated though, Mr. Cuchero, the definitions uh, in the proposed ordinance are, they're not, they don't exist as far as we know. I'm just asking Mr. Vandenkoy how he was supporting his decision or his recommendation and that and this is his testimony. That was my only purpose. I'm not making any findings myself. I was just asking and helping Mr. Vandenkoy to, uh, to more explicitly support his recommendation. Uh, then if I may ask Mr. Vandenkoy, then there are recommendations in the master plan and the land use ordinance um, that were, uh, and in the land use amendment that were not included in the ordinance, correct? That's correct. These ordinances are, are relatively narrow in scope. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last bit. These ordinances are relatively narrow in scope. They, they focus on specific recommendations from the 2019 master plan reexamination and the 2019 land use plan element amendment. And there were specific recommendations, but not all of those um, uses were included in these particular ordinances, right? Um, the, the, recommend, the ordinances before the board tonight reflect the specific uses recommended in those documents in the, the reexamination and the land use plan amendment. So there, there's, no, there's no inclusion for a landscaping business, right? And That's, that was in the master plan. It was in, as a different recommendation in a different subsection. That's correct though. You're, you're saying it wasn't under SED light? No, there was landscaping businesses were addressed in the um, the master plan reexamination report, but they are not listed as a principal permitted use in the um, the SED light district ordinance uh, that was before the board tonight. They are listed as a conditional. Use. They were proposed as a conditional use in the master plan and the land use amendment, but not in the ordinance. That is correct. On page 45, they were, they were proposed as a conditional use, and um, but in the ordinance tonight, they're they are not included um, as a proposed conditional use. And the same thing is true as far as trade contractor businesses? That's correct. 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> just as an aside, um, it's, uh, you know, flex space is in, in high demand. And that's one of the reasons why we're, we're encouraging that this ordinance go back and, and be redrafted and really look at, look at the properties in the zone and come up with something that's narrowly tailored um, for flex space, for the multiple uses, for really being able to develop the area in a, in a responsible way. Um, so again, uh, recommend that the board um, suggest it's not uh, substantially compliant to the council. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else for the public? I don't see Ellen. anyone else, but just give me one second. Oh yes, I do have one more person with their hand up. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Parisi. Hey, Mr. Parisi, you swear or affirm uh, the testimony about to give this board is true, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes. Please say and spell your name and give us your address. Mark Parisi, uh, P-A-R-I-S-I, to Castleport. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, you know allowing public comment on uh, this particular ordinance tonight. Um, it's been some interesting conversation. Uh, I really couldn't say it better than uh, what uh, Joan Osborne and Sheila Hatami have said, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I did have some some questions, and I I went and I looked um, at at the master plan, um, and under the original master plan that was uh, adopted by the planning board uh, in December of 1994. Uh, the, the land use plan goals uh, were enumerated, there are six of them. I just wanted to read them uh, for the planning board as you deliberate on this ordinance tonight. Uh, number one was to protect the township's remaining rural areas from suburban sprawl. Number two, protect the rural character of areas outside of centers. Number three, protect residential areas from incompatible non-residential development. Number four, upgrade the township standards for street tree plantings and on-site landscaping. Number five, encourage the preservation of agricultural and farmland within the township. And number six, use cluster development in a manner to best serve the township. It goes on to um, a little bit later on uh, under the economic plan. It, uh, number one is maintain the township's commercial industrial tax base, which contributes 13% of each tax dollar to the township. Um, so, so I, I had a couple questions and comments. Number one, talking about the tax base, I was wondering if the planner, if anybody, or any of the professionals could just discuss uh, what the commercial tax base is right now, if we have, are maintaining that the 13% as uh, articulated in the master plan itself, uh, and with all of the additional commercial development that's going on, and how or whether or not there's a need to rezone this these parcels to SCD light for additional commercial tax base. Mr. Chair, whether there's a need to rezone or not, that's not really the issue for the planning board. It is an issue for the governing body, you know, and that's certainly something that can be discussed at the public hearing whenever that's scheduled. But we're just looking at does the master plan is this substantially consistent with the master plan, not whether it's needed or, or not needed? Okay, well, I, I, thank you. Yeah, I, it, so as far as consistency with the master plan, is this rezoning of this property, is this going to provide uh, benefit the, the commercial tax base? Is there, is, can there, any, can there, can you comment on that at all or is that not necessarily an issue of consistency? I don't find the economics of it to be an issue of consistency. We're looking at the plain language of, of the master plan. And is it substantially consistent with the plain language? Not whether it's needed, not what you know, tax revenue it's gonna bring is, is it something that you know, was contemplated by the master plan? 
Okay. So then getting back to the original uh, six points that I uh, mentioned, um, when it talks about protect residential areas from incompatible non-residential development, uh, I'd just like to read uh, to, to the planning board and into the record what the uh, our township's ordinances define as agricultural rural estate zones. Purpose, the purpose of the ARE1, ARE3, ARE4, and ARE6 zones is to minimize the impacts of development in areas located outside of the centers identified in the township's master plan. The goals include preservation of rural and agricultural uses and preservation of rural character. Many areas include significant environmental constraints, including wetlands, floodplains, rare and endangered species, habitats, aquifer recharge areas, and high quality watersheds. So at some point, maybe the planner could ask, uh, answer this question. Do you know, uh, you know, I know that in the past, uh, you know, going back maybe some 50 years ago or longer that this area was zoned for industrial uses. And then at some point thereafter, there was a decision made by <laughs> this planning board and the governing body to rezone certain areas to ARE6, as I just uh, read what the definition of ARE6 is. So, uh, and, and now there's a move to, <clears throat> excuse me, to move back more towards industrial. My question is, do you know if the, the rezoning of these properties to, uh, to ARE6 occurred before or after the master plan in December of 1994? Um, I, I don't have the, the exact dates in, in front of me. Um, well, but Mr. Chairman, the, the history is, is not what the board's being asked to do here by the statute. So we're asked to look at this master plan that exists currently right now. And mm -hmm. is this proposed ordinance, is it substantially consistent with this master plan? So- Correct. I mean, and these, these kinds of, is it fair for me to say that these type of questions and comments are better suited to be brought to the council? I, I think, yeah, I'm not saying that they're irrelevant as, as a matter of law, period. I'm saying that they, we have a very narrow scope that the municipal land use law gives us. I think those are all relevant questions. You know, even going back to your question regarding is, you know, um, is, this, is this needed? You know, th those are certainly questions and comments and, and discourse that you can have at the council level. We're just, you know, we have a very narrow lane here. Right. Okay, so, and, and I, I appreciate, you know, your, your, your comment there. Uh, we know that at right now these, these uh, parcels are zoned for ARE6. We know that ARE6 is defined as preserving of rural and agricultural uses. We know that the master plan from 1994 clearly states that uh, one of its land use plan goals is to protect residential areas from incompatible non-residential development. What this ordinance is doing is changing this ARE6 zone to an industrial use, which seems to be inconsistent with the goal of ARE6 and the master plan from 1994. Um, you know, and, and, and I would just, you know, implore the planning boards to, uh, you know, think about the fact that with the, the, there's mixed uses up there already. We, we recognize that we've talked about that tonight. We don't need to, you know, rehash that any further. But if a residential property owner who's living up there right now intends to stay there because they've been there for several decades, their property is now going to be rezoned to a, a, an industrial use as defined in SCD light, they basically have a choice to either continue to live as a non-conforming uh, residential use or to sell their property and get out. Wouldn't it just make more sense to leave everything AR6? And if somebody wants to get a, go to the zoning board to get a variance- hey, Mr. To... Parisi, this is again, this is council, you know, right. appropriate, but not, not for what we're here to do tonight. Okay, I appreciate it. Well, then I, I, I've, I've said what I have to say. I, I thank you for giving me the time to speak tonight. You're welcome. Have a good night. All right, thank you. Anybody else? I do not see anyone else with their hand raised. Okay, all right, we'll close the public portion of this ordinance. 
And if anybody else on the board has any further comments, I'll take a motion to determine if this ordinance is substantially consistent with the master plan. In an effort to expedite this, to get this to council and to flush out all things, I will make that motion. That, that it is you. substantially consistent. Substantially consistent, yes. We'll have a second. Second. Mr. Cachero, am I allowed to make a second as the chairman? Yes. Then I'll make the second. <clears throat> Ready for roll call? Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Dorado? No. Mr. Husser? I don't want to go through my five pages of notes here, but I will be brief. Um, in my narrow lane, quote unquote, uh, I, I, can't, I cannot say with a straight face that this is substantially consistent with the master plan. Uh, so I am voting no. Mr. Leggio? No. Mr. Nicastro? Can you hear me now? Now we can hear yeah. you. Okay. I, I still have some questions for Peter. Um, Pete, there was some there was some uh, questions that arose to 1994, um, the original master plan, and as we know that there are constantly reexamines of reexamine of master plans, um, which kind of evolve into you know future things and happening. So. I can appreciate what was said in 1994, but there's been how many re-examinations since 1994 that kind of changed the landscape of the town or the direction as leaders have envisioned. Um, can, can, you, can you talk a little bit about what process went into this specific zone as to make it more in line with what's there? Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, I believe so, yeah. So essentially what we did at the master plan subcommittee level is we, we looked at the overall context of this area um, in terms of its proximity to Route 33, for example, um, the, uh, the land uses that are existing. Um, and, um, you know, we actually literally looked at the, the um, composition of the land uses in terms of residential and non-residential, the land area and, and all those different things. And, um, you know, we also looked at the, the essentially the evolution of that area, which, you know, some things have changed, but not a whole lot. As was stated previously, you know, some of those, those more intensive uses have been there for a long time. There's been an opportunity for residential development for quite a long time as well, since the 1990s. Um, and before that, it was industrial. No residential development of any, you know, substantial natures has occurred there in the past, um, you know, 25 years or so. Um, the character of the area is, is non-residential. It's, it's essentially a light industrial area. In terms of the existing uses and it's got some operating farms it's mostly a non-residential area so all those things were factored in and you know given those things from a land use perspective given that um, locating a other later intensity non-residential uses close to the more intensive ones that are existing is more compatible than locating single family homes next to, next to more intensive industrial uses factoring all those types of uh, planning principles in it was um determined that on balance, it, it does make more sense to recommend it as a, uh, as a non-residential zone. And that's really, uh, you know, some of the key points that we're thinking that occurred as part of the, the recommendation. And did that part of recommendation take into account what future, what, what other zones were, were zoned, for example, up Route 33, the, the senior housing, you know, that's coming into play? Yeah. Um, no, it, it, it did. I, you know, I mean, there, there's, um, 
you know, we looked at the the entire area, and there is um, the military base isn't far from there. It's it's within within you know three thousand feet of, of the military base as another regional land use consideration. Um, there's a, a lot of different thought that went into it, but overall, the um, the recommendation, I it's my opinion that it's it's more compatible. Um, it is it's entirely compatible with the uses that are within that zone, and to I think more so than it would be if it was single family residential within that zone, given the, uh, the nature of the int intensive industrial uses there. Okay. In my limited capacity, I'm voting yes, it's substantial. I would just say on the record that I think some recommendations that come out of this meeting tonight should be uh, considered by the council. Um, and that's their role as a planning board member. I know my role. So um, that's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Castro. Mr. Seaman? Um, I'm kind of going to echo Mr. Nicastro's thoughts, but I would like Ron to clarify something for me from a procedural standpoint. Us deeming it substantially consistent with the master plan is what gives the council the ability to hear it and to adjust. Is that no. fair to say? No. The council gets to hear it no matter what your vote is. It's just that the uh, voting requirement would be different. So let's assume you vote that it's not substantially consistent. The council still gets to have a hearing. It has to have it. It is scheduled the hearing. It's just that now it requires the affirmative vote of a majority of the, of the full authorized membership. So three votes, no matter how many people are there. If you vote that it is substantially consistent, the board, the council will still have a, a, their hearing. It's just now it's a simple majority of the quorum that's present. Also, um, if you vote that it's not substantially consistent, not only is there the voting requirement, but the town council is also required to adopt a uh, resolution explaining why it's adopting an ordinance that the planning board found to be substantially inconsistent. But they will have a hearing no matter what the vote is, or if there's no vote, you know, of, of the planning of the planning board. Okay, so our vote really, it, it makes passing it a little bit more difficult, requires them to do a few other things, but it doesn't prohibit the hearing. Absolutely correct, yes. All right, then in that case, I am, I'm gonna vote no because I think there needs to be some serious revisions and I'm not entirely comfortable voting yes at this point. Okay, Mr. Everett? No. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to interject one, one additional point. Um, this was also included in the 2014 uh, land use plan element, this recommendation. So I just wanted to put that Thank on the record. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry to interrupt. Deputy Mayor O'Donnell. Uh, yes. And Chairman Tannenhaus. Yes. We have three yeses and five, uh, four, five noes. So it motion fails. Okay. I don't know about you, but two and a half hours, I'm taking a potty break. So we're gonna we're gonna take five minutes here and we'll get to some applications. Everybody, please, it's 928 now. Please be back here by 932. Can we uh Brian? Yeah. Can we make it 10 minutes? I got a, I got a Dalmatian too that has to take a potty break. So, very good. That's fine. Thank you, sir. Me. I'd like to have some dinner. The planning board will now take a recess. We'll be back at 9 38. Yes, the planning board will now reconvene. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right, first up is a resolution for case number SP-1077. Eligible voters are Mr. Gerardo, Mr. Huston, Mr. Leggio, Mr. Seaman, Mr. Everett, and myself. Do I have a motion, please? Motion. motion. Thank you. Do I have a second? No, sir. Who made the motion? I think there was like three of us. I, I made the motion. Mr. And who was the second? I second. Okay. Thank you. Roll Mr. call, please. Carano? Yes. Mr. Husser? Yes. Mr. Leggio? Yes. Mr. Seaman? 
Yes. Mr. Everett? Yes. And Chairman Tannenhaus? Yes. Motion carries resolutions memorialized. Okay, we have a submission waiver up, case number SD-2991. <clears throat> Minor subdivision with ancillary bulk variances. Uh, let me see who that is. We have counsel. Who's counsel for that? That is Mr. Pape. I'm going to bring Mr. him. Mr. Pape. I think uh, Jared tonight rather than yeah. Ken. Ah. Okay. Yep, there he is. Mr. Pape, do I need to bring anyone else into the meeting? Uh, Mr. Chicatano is on the line, but he, he does need to be brought in. He's, he's okay. just uh, observing. You're able to hear me okay? Yes, we can. We can. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Jared Pape uh, uh, with the law firm of Heilburn Pape on behalf of Mark Chicatano, the applicant. Um, this is a, a submission waiver. I'll be quite brief. We received and reviewed Ms. Newman's letter dated October 20. 2020. Uh, on page three, she lists 18 checklist items. And just like to state that uh, the applicant would like to withdraw the submission waiver requests, all of them with the exceptions of A, B, C, D, E, N as in Nancy, and P. All others uh, would be withdrawn. So with, I'll defer to Ms. Newman, but that's all, all we have. Hey, Lord, okay. I swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. So just to clarify, Mr. Pape, you're going to submit these items and then would be deemed complete, or you that's the plan, correct? Correct. We would the the items that we're withdrawing would be revised to be included on the plan. Okay, so except for those ones you mentioned, except for the items that I had mentioned. So, so uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I am comfortable. I had the opportunity to review some of these with Mr. Pape's office in advance, and I just feel like some of the plat details should be provided. Um, it is a minor subdivision with no improvements, but I did think that was important. So, with the items that are going to be provided, I take no exception to the granting of the waivers as requested, which I specifically were A through E. N and P as listed in my report uh, for the purposes of deeming this application complete. Thank you. And can you just explain why you think the typography in item N is not required? <laughs> is that just because that would be something to be brought up during an actual fit out of the site? That's correct, Mr. Tenenhouse. There's no improvements proposed. So certainly in order to do a, if the board were to act favorably and they submitted for a plot plan, those details would be reviewed in house, but this is a minor subdivision with no improvements proposed. M Mr. Hey, Chair, also, have... I, just, I just want to be clear that, and it's in all the resolutions, when the board grants submission waivers, it's only for purposes of being declared complete. If the board finds that that information is necessary during the hearing process, it always reserves the right to ask for it. Thank you. You just took the words out of my mouth. Mr. Pape, you recognize that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Does that, does that uh, conclude your testimony? It does. Okay. Does anybody from the board have any questions or comments? If not, yes, I'll entertain a motion. Go ahead. Mr. Dorado, did you have a question? No, no. I just looked at the... Uh paperwork on it on my phone. So um, I, I will make a motion. Okay, thank you. I'll have a second. second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mr. Dorado? Yes. Mr. Husser? Yes. Mr. Leggio? Yes. Mr. Nicastro? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. Mr. Everett? Yes. And Deputy Mayor O'Donnell? Oh, yes. And Chairman Tannenhaus? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Very well. Okay. Um, next on the agenda 
is case number SP-1006, Gill Petroleum, Visual Use, Preliminary and Final Major Site Plan. Eileen, I'm recusing Eileen. myself. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Rob. Good night. Good night. Okay. We still have a quorum, right? Yes, we do. Thank you. Miss. <laughs> Mr. Alfieri, do you need anyone else brought into the hearing? Yes, we do. We have um, two witnesses. We have um, Richard Simon and Justin Alciello. Okay. Give me one minute. Okay. You see them? They're there, Eileen? I don't see Rich, but I'm asking him to start his video now, and he should be. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Salvatore Alfieri, Cleary, Giacobbe, Alfieri, and Jacobs on behalf of the applicant. Believe it or not, um, uh, well, first, uh, a couple of preliminary things. First of all, Ron Gazerowski was, a, was previously representing the gas station uh, two hour north. Uh, since the last hearing, um, his client has agreed to withdraw its objection. So, in, unless Mr. Gazarowski is on the screen, uh, which um, that would that he will not be appearing to object. Uh, secondly, um, during the course of the many uh, meetings that we testified, uh, additional questions came up about the environmental condition of the property and the board had requested that Mr. Stein, Stein come back to the board to testify on some lingering questions. So um, we have Mr. Simon um, from Parsons back. He's our LSRP or the LSRP of BP actually. And we're going to call him as our first witness to ju just address four questions that came up um, and then, of course, any questions the board or the public may have. Hey, Mr. Simons, do you swear? Uh, we just need you on. All right. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah. Please state and spell your name for the record. Uh, R I C H A R D S I M U N. And, and Mr. Simon, in reviewing my notes in preparation for this meeting, I realized that you last testified almost two years ago in January of 2019. So um, just to refresh the board's recollection, can you ad advise the board as to what your connection is to this property and the environmental um, issues that relate to the property? Okay. Uh, I'm an LSRP, which is a licensed site remediation professional. I uh, represent the uh, responsible party for the site, which is uh, BP Petroleum. So the uh, uh, the site was a subject of a ground steward case, uh, which was the subject of uh, rem ongoing remediation. So uh, as of the last time uh, we met, uh, or the last time I board meeting in 2019. Since that time, we have submitted a remediation permit application to NJDP, which is basically uh, one of the final steps in uh, securing DEPs of a long-term monitoring plan for a monitor natural attenuate remedy to address the, uh, the residual groundwater impacts at the site. Uh, so that application was officially submitted to NJDP with a check back in August of 2020. And uh, we are currently awaiting uh, NJD, NJDEP approval of that permit. And can you just explain to the board, if that permit is granted, what would happen next on site? Uh, uh, we environment. Uh, we would transition into a, a, a biennial sampling program uh, where we have a uh, predicted time frame where the uh, the remaining contaminant plume is 
to degrade approximately the next 10 years. So the, uh, the CEA will is set to expire in 20, 2030. So every two years, we will be out there collecting groundwater samples uh, in accordance with the NJDEP approved permit uh, to amend that monitor natural attenuation is still sufficient in the residual contamination and that uh, in the 2030 timeframe, uh, we will attain groundwater and at that point there will no more no more ground restrictions on the property. And um, you had previously testified that the proposed development of the site um, um, as it relates to what we presented to the board would not in impact in any way the environmental um, uh, monitoring or condition of the property. And is your, your testimony remain the same that this project will not impact in any way your, your, your activities that are on site? Uh, that's correct. It will not impact our ability to monitor the plume uh, for the uh, the remainder of the uh, day and the permit time. A second question that was raised is that there are apparently wells located on the village's property across the street. Um, we had asked you to look into that and investigate it and determine whether they are in fact BP wells. Have you had a chance to do that? Uh, yes. So uh, BP has not uh, installed any wells on that side of uh, there is a well search document that shows the location of a well uh, off of I believe it's Arbor Drive uh, but that well is not associated with BP or the uh, the case ongoing at the uh, the subject property uh, the findings were also reviewed by the uh, uh, Powell environmental commission going back a few years about 2016 time frame and uh basically at that point the environmental commission after uh, multiple visits to the site uh found no indication that there was a monitoring well there so they could not locate an well on that side of the prop or that side of route nine rather and um can you Give the board a, your your feeling as to or an opinion as to whether there will be an impact of the remediation on the project and whether the construction proposal for the project will in any way interfere with the location of the monitoring. Uh, currently, we don't believe there's any impact to our current network of monitoring wells. Uh, there is, there is a mechanism with NJDE that we can relocate a monitoring well and submit an amendment to our remedial action permit. And, and during the course of this development, the applicant coordinate with your office uh, if there is going to be. Is that correct? That's my understanding. That's correct. All right. And the, the there are two other questions that came up. Um, if there's a gap gasoline spill from, from a gas pump filling a car, would that in any way impact the monitoring wells? Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, monitoring wells used for our monitoring purpose of the, uh, the CEA case uh, would not be located within the, uh, the tank or the, uh, the new tank location. Uh, the outside of the footprint of where those tanks are and the way a monitoring well is constructed uh, they have a protective road cap and they also have an expandable plug that goes inside the top of the monitoring well that prevents any liquid or foreign liquids from the surface uh, from entering the well. And the final question was uh, clarification as to whether or not there was any off-site contamination resulting from this spill in question? Uh, no, there's not. So uh, when the, uh, the original tank uh, remediation occurred, the soil remediation, approximately 20 soil were removed from the property. It's verified by post-excavation sampling. Uh, there were a few rounds of soil sampling that back in 2011. Uh, that confirmatory sampling was all below standards in effect. 
uh, indicating there's no offsite contamination. And currently after the uh, tanks were removed with the, uh, the soil that went off of the tanks, uh, remaining on the site above applicable standards. Uh, as far as groundwater, uh, ground uh, the plume is within the property boundaries. And uh, those figures uh, showing the delineation of the plume and the current extents of the plume are documented in our remedial action report that was submitted to NJDEP in 2018 and uh, also reiterated in our remedial action permit application, which is currently under review uh, with the NJDEP. And when that permit is issued, you would, will you agree that you'll provide a copy to my office? down correct we will okay. uh, mr chair that's those were the only follow-up questions we had of, of mr Simon. thank you appreciate that does anybody from the board have any comments or questions uh yeah as a fellow lsrp rich um we, you know we have three lsrps on the environmental commission uh reviewed all the documents and everything. And I think something that's getting missed here, that's this has been an ongoing case for a long time, is there's a responsible party, okay? It's not the developer right now, okay? It's the responsible party that was there prior. Rich is the LSRP, with his license taking care of that. Um, that needs to be stressed. Uh, number two, we don't see as far as the three LSRPs on the environmental commission that there's any issue whatsoever uh, what that has been done nor that what needs to be done in the future. There, there will be future monitoring uh, as required. Um, what Rich is talking about is called a remedial action permit and the DEP right now there's not many people in Trenton uh, so typically these things take a long time when they're are people in Trenton, they're very significantly like delayed right now. So um, as far as, you know, I go, I, I, I don't see any issues with it as far as an environmental. Perspective. I think every, everything's been done right. Um, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Okay. Counselor, if there's no more, nothing from your side of the fence, could we, is there any other testimony that you're going to present today? Yes. Do you, um, are you going to hold the public questions until the witnesses are finished? I think that's probably the best way to handle that today, considering it's, it's almost 10 o'clock. Yeah, that's fine with me. So, Mr. Mr. Simon, don't go away. You might be asked some questions momentarily. Okay. Mr. Alciello is our next witness. Mr. Alfieri, I don't, I don't remember. Did Mr. Alciello testify previously? He has not. Yes. No. Uh, oh, no, no. Not, not on this on... application. Right. Okay. All right. So do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this board the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state and spell your name for the record. It's uh, uh, Justin Alciello, A-U-C-I-E-L-L-O with uh, Gaffone Consulting Group, Red Bank. Okay, if you can just qualify him, Mr. Alfieri. Uh, Mr. Alciello, we're seeking to have you qualified as a professional planner. Would you place your credentials on the record, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I have a uh, master's degree in city regional planning uh, from Rutgers University in 2005. Uh, I've been a licensed uh, planner in the state of New Jersey since uh, 2007. Uh, I provided testimony uh, in front of uh, more than um, 150 uh, land use boards uh, throughout the state of New Jersey. Uh, I have appeared in Howell previously. Uh, I've appeared uh, multiple times at the zoning board. Uh, at the planning board, uh, I appeared over the summer, um, and uh, we'll I believe that was back credentials. in June. We'll accept your credentials. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Justin, this is a, um, a convenience store gas station is a, a, is a um, conditional use in this zone. 
Um, would you provide your testimony first as to whether we meet the conditions that are set forth in the ordinance, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, so as the board is, is familiar, this site is located um, Wyckoff Mills Road and Route 9, uh, Block 140, Lots 1, 2, 3, 4.01 uh, in, in the HD1 zone. Um, and I'm not going to belabor the point of uh, what what currently uh, existed or, or, or previously uh, existed, um, uh, you know, on this property and also the improvements. I think the, the board has heard, uh, um, you know, much testimony to that effect. However, um, you know, as to the, the conditional use um, requirements, uh, there are um, some variances that are required uh, with this application. Um, and as to the lot area uh, as required is, uh, is, uh, is 80,000 square feet. Uh, the existing condition lot area is 28,641 square feet. Um, the next standard that we don't meet is uh, the lot coverage uh, and the maximum allowed is 70%. Uh, and as proposed, uh, the lot coverage is 71.5%. Uh, uh, the next variance is for the, uh, the front yard setback. Um, and this is this is interesting because uh, since and I'll you know get into this a bit later, but uh, this property has frontage, uh, actually three front yards, um, Wyckoff Mills, and then the road kind of curves a bit when it gets towards Route Nine. Uh, I believe in the board planner's letter that's noted as a second front yard, uh, and then the third front yard is on is on Route Nine. So uh, the minimum. Um, Front yard setback is 60 feet. Um, a, a front yard of, of, of 15 feet is proposed along Route 9 for the convenience store. 13.42. Uh, 13, 13 I'm sorry. 13.42 um, feet for the canopy and 59 feet for the um, kiosk structure. Um, uh, on on Whitecoff Mills, there's a setback of 23.7 feet uh, for the convenience store. Uh, for the kiosk, 30 feet, and 12.8 uh, feet for the canopy. Uh, the next variance required is um, the minimum uh, side yard setback is 25 feet, uh, or the height of the building, uh, whichever is greater. And as proposed, there's a, a setback of, of five feet from the uh, north room side yard. Uh, the accessory buildings are permitted in the side or rear yards only, and uh, the accessory structures as proposed are located in the front yard for uh, Route 9 and um, Wyckoff Mills Road. There are uh, a number of variances. Um, Mr. Chair, do you want me to go through all these variances? Uh, there are a number of them. Um, I'll defer over to, uh, to you, sir. Okay, um, I'll, and I'll defer to my professionals. Uh, Mr. Cuchero, do we need to swear Laura back in? Uh, I think Laura was sworn in earlier in the uh, in the hearing process. My uh, subject to Laura, my recommendation would be that let's identify what the variances are, and then I think you know. I mean, well, number one, you can handle it however you want to handle it. It's your application. My recommendation would be we identify uh, the variances and you go through them. If you want to go through them, you know, collectively, that's fine. And then if you want to identify any design waivers and address them, you know, you can, uh, you can do that. Uh, but I don't, you know, I, I leave it to you. I don't know that we need to go through positive and negative criteria for each individual variance versus, you know, taking some of them collectively that are similar in right. nature. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, because we were here for, for three hours. So, uh, you know, just try to be respectful to you, Mr. Chair, and not take up uh, no, no, too much of your time. Don't worry. Um, don't worry. Well, let's uh, uh, let's uh, talk about time. You, you do, you do what you provide testimony that you need to provide. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's much appreciated. Um, uh, so, so for the variances, uh, I see this uh, as, as, as C1 variances, uh, the, uh, the state um, land use law statute allows for a showing of uh, either a hardship under the C1 uh, or, or the benefits um, that, that away the detriments under the C2, also known as, uh, as, as flexible C. Um, but I actually see them as a mixture of both. Uh, and I'll tell you why uh, I, 
you know, think that there are numerous uh, hardship factors here uh, that are at play. Um, you know, as to the, uh, not only the layout of the site, um, but what surrounds the site. As I had previously said, uh, there are three, three frontages, uh, two on, um, on um, Wyckoff Mills Road and one on Route 9. Um, so when we're looking at the uh, front and, and rear yard setback uh, issues, uh, not only uh, are we impacted given uh, the fact that we have three front yards and one rear yard, um, but also the, the irregular nature of the property. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's oddly shaped as it goes toward the curvature of, uh, of White Clock Mills going towards Route 9. Um, so so as, it's, as it's stated in, uh, in the board planner's letter, um, and I'll quote, uh, the, the shape of the property, I'm sorry. No one said anything. Okay. Uh, the the um, shape of the property on the corner means that there is is no rear yard. Um, so so like I had said, there there are, there are three front yards. That is a clear hardship. Also, um, you know, given the the length of the property, uh, which is which is much greater than the width, um, it's it would be. Uh, you know, unrealistic to really, uh, you know, develop a use that would be practical at this location that would be compliant with all of the, uh, the, the setback requirements. So that's another issue, in my opinion, uh, you know, as to the, uh, the, the, the um, you know, hardship here. However, when you're looking at uh, the C2 aspect of this or the flexible C, I would say that, that despite these hardships, uh, the applicant has managed uh, to design a plan that's uh, that's that's safe uh, and 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 works for the site. You know, given these uh, these constraints. Uh, also, it's important to remember that uh, the property was previously used as a uh, service station, uh, and it's my opinion that uh, this is a, a substantial upgrade uh, to to their previous use. Um, and also, uh, as to the impervious coverage which is only a, a minor increase from the existing condition. Um, I would also say that with, uh, it's, it's my professional opinion that uh, the, the stormwater management uh, upgrades um, mitigate that slight increase in the impervious coverage. So uh, with respect to uh, the purposes of zoning uh, under the C2 analysis, uh, that it's my opinion we advance, uh, I would say that uh, it advances uh, criteria G I believe that there is uh, uh, sufficient space, um, you know, for um, this commercial use, uh, and I would also say um, criteria M. I believe that this is a, a efficient use uh, of the land as well. Um, so, as I had said, given those those hardships, and despite those hardships, the applicant has uh, has managed to develop this site in a way um, that that would be be efficient. Uh, and suitable um, for this property at this location uh, in a zone where it's permitted. Um, uh, lastly, as the board is aware, uh, there, are, there are two prongs of the um, uh, negative criteria. The first is uh, whether or not the variances uh, would present a substantial detriment to the public good. Now, it's not any detriment. Uh, the law says that, that any potential detriment must rise to the level of being substantial. Um, it's my opinion that in this application, there is no substantial um, uh, detriment to the public good. Uh, this is a significant upgrade of the property. Uh, as I had said, uh, safe and functional. Uh, the site is, uh, is next to a uh, commercial use to the north uh, and also is along uh, Route 9, a, a commercial corridor. Um, that also uh, feeds into my opinion uh, as to uh, the purposes of the master plan. Uh, the redevelopment of the site is, is consistent with a general goal uh, of uh, the purpose of, 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 of the master plan. Uh, master plan also speaks to the need to adapt to the changing uh, di um, dynamics and demands of uh, the, um, of the um, community as well, uh, the economy. Um, so certainly I would say that uh, not only is there no substantial in the public good, but we also advance uh, the aims of the master plan. Uh, and lastly, uh, I don't see that the granting of this variance 
or these variances would impair the intent of, uh, of the zone plan and the zoning ordinance. Um, I certainly, again, this is a permitted use in uh, the HD1 zone. Uh, and I believe that, um, that if the board so chooses to grant approval, it can be done uh, in a way that advances uh, the intent and the purpose of the uh, zoning ordinance. Um, that concludes my testimony. Um, thank you. Mr. Osiello, just to follow up. So um, the variances that you just described are all the C variances. Um, as I started at the beginning of my question to you, this property is a, this use is a conditional use in the zone. And there are three conditions that the ordinance sets forth um, that have to be met in order to, to qualify as a con permitted conditional use as, a, as opposed to a, a D variance use that would have to go to the zoning board. Um, and I, although the planner, uh, the board planner acknowledges in, in his report that we meet those conditions, I just wanted you to confirm that we do in fact meet those three conditions. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, these conditions, uh, as noted on, on page, um, this looks like page three of uh, the April 12th, uh, 2019 letter uh, from the board planner. Um, these conditions are, are set forth at section 188, 98.4 uh, uh, in the zoning ordinance. Uh, and those conditions are A, uh, the location of a gas station and convenience center shall be limited to corner lots fronting on a state highway and with, uh, with direct access from both the highway and uh, the, the intersection street. Uh, we meet that. Uh, B is, is any gasoline station and convenience center, which includes uh, the accessory on-premise food consumption, shall limit the floor area devoted to such activities to 20% of the gross floor area of the uh, principal building. We meet that, we comply there and C, there, should, there shall be no drive-through facilities associated with the gasoline station and uh, convenience center. Uh, we comply with that as well. All right, thank you. That concludes our presentation, Mr. Chair. And thank you very much. So no other further witnesses? No, that's all. Okay. Does anybody from the board have any comments? Any of our professionals comments? Mr. Chairman, I would just state on the record, I know this case has spanned some time. Um, so in, in lieu of not saying anything, I would note that the, app the applicant's engineer previously agreed to comply with all comments in our report, and therefore I have nothing additional at this time. Yeah, and I believe that there was also some, I know it's not this, but architectural stuff. There was a whole bunch of stuff that was agreed to over the last couple of testimonies. And you got your work cut out for you for the resolution. Okay. Um, Mr. Peter. Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, um, thank the applicant for the uh, confirmation on the conditional use requirements and uh, the testimony. Um, there's been numerous hearings leading up to this one. So in going through my notes, all my, my questions have essentially been answered at this point. So I have, you know, I think the testimony was, was complete. I think they covered all the bases on the briefs and I have, I have nothing further at this time. Thank you. As far as the board members are concerned, you know, I, I don't fit all the board members on my screen, so I can't see visually if you have any questions or comments. So if you could unmute yourself. Uh, just Brian, again, with the environmental, we've been through this over and over and over again. It's not the applicants, it's the obligation of the prior, okay? And that needs to be stressed in 2000 Understood. Thank you. Anybody else got comments? Nick kind of answered my question because I know we've sat through a couple meetings. So if he's if he's good with it, that that's good okay. for me. Thank you, Mr. Toronto. I guess I just feel like, you know, looking at it as many times as we had, yes, we all recognize it's a very oddly shaped lot, but there's nothing we can do about it. And I just don't know what else you would ever put on this piece of property. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. I, I agree as well. Okay. All right, I guess at this point we'll open it up to the public. Eileen, do we have anybody from the public? Wishing well, to speak? Sal, I just yeah. want to confirm that these are all the, your case is over now. Our case is over, yes. Okay, so Mr. Chair, when we open it to the public, I would mm -hmm. open it for questions and testimony. 
Okay, thank you for the clarification. So now we're at the point, that's right. We, we had, we had, we did not do testimony yet. So if anybody has any questions or testimony that they'd like to speak about on this application, please feel free to do so. Um, it is after 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm committed to, to stay under an hour or so to see if we can get to conclusion on this application. Do we need to, do I need to just make that uh, decision? I'm in. Mr. Kuchera? You're, you're the hearing officer, so it's up to you. All right, we're, we're making that decision. Okay. Does any members of the public wish to ask questions or comments on this application? Please use the raise your hand feature and you will be brought into the meeting one at a time. You will need to have audio, video, and you will need to give us your name, address, and be sworn in. I do have someone raising their hand. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I just like to know what's the address. Well, just, just, actually, sir, let me just swear you in first. Sure. And then you can get going. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, but I'm not giving testimony. I just wanted to know what is the is the uh, well, address. Well, you still have to you still have to identify yourself. Okay. So my you name just... is Guy. My name is Guy Vastola. And your address, sir? Twelve ninety nine Highway thirty three. Okay, go ahead. I just looking at what is the address that we're speaking about now? It's 695 US Highway 9. That clarifies it for me. Yes, I was I was late in, in the Zoom meeting and I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything in particular. Thank you. That's all I need to say. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Anybody else? Give me one second. Eileen, while you're doing that, uh, Mr. Alfieri. Yes. Between the last hearing and this hearing, we did receive numerous uh, exhibits uh, from members of the public. Those exhibits, th those exhibits were placed on the exhibit list and sent to you. Do you have any objections to any of those items, or can we? No, I have no objections. Okay. I, have object, I have objections to relevancy as they come up, but no objection to them being offered. No. All right, so then uh, we'll move all those into uh, into evidence then. Okay, thank you. If there's any other members of the public that wish to speak on this application, please raise your hand. Do we have, how many people do we have in the public? Thirteen. Yeah, and, and several of them are, are part of the applicant team. Yes, I see a couple of the gills. Uh, we'll still give it a few moments, you know, just for people to, you know, try and use the technology if they're if they're struggling. Do I, Ron, do we just want to open it up to everybody real quick? And if someone has something, they can speak and then we can try to narrow it down to those 13. Well, no, it's that Eileen has done it. You know, there's a raise your hand feature. Um, ah. So anyone who wants, I mean, there may be people who are just here to watch. And we're and we're in still we're in full compliance of all of the state's emergency yes. regulations for using. That's okay. correct. And if they don't raise their hand, they can't be brought in, correct? Well, also, um, we did provide, I believe, Eileen, um, a telephone number as well for access, correct? I do have one person on the phone, but they're not calling in here. It's just they've used their phone to call into the meeting. And there's a way uh, to participate. Only one person on the phone. And if you want to participate using the phone, I believe there's a number also, right? Yes. What, what number is that? 
there's several numbers. No, I mean, if you once you call the number and you get in, I believe there's like um, like two digits or something that you would press if you wanted to raise your hand. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, so let's just let's just open it up to everybody that's that's in the public there. Okay, Eileen, just make sure we don't miss anybody. Bring all them right. all in. Let's open it up. Let's let's have let if if as we're opening it, if everybody could just be respectful and and not try to talk over one another. And we then need, uh, we don't need to bring the gills in though, correct? This is not. Mr. Alfieri? You can bring them in, but I will not let them speak. So okay. you can let them in. Let us know when it's all, all open. I like. And it's unmuted. Hello. I read Barbara Dixon. Hold on one second, Barbara. Okay. Anybody else? We're getting some feedback. Can you identify which? I know Miss Pixel wants to speak, so I'm going to mute everybody else and let her go for now. Okay, go okay, ahead. Okay, thank you. Barbara, do you have video? I have the video. I'm watching you. <laughs> you have a camera too. On the moon. Uh, Miss Dixel, she's asking if you can turn your video on so we can see you. It's on. It's on. No, we you. No, your video has to be on, so you're projecting yourself to us. I don't know. I don't know how to do all this modern stuff. I just have to, I have to read something from the Villages Board of Trustees. Okay, well, let's get you on the record, Mrs. Dixel, because you're providing testimony now, so... All right. All right. Mr. Mr. Dixel, you swear or affirm the testimony about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Please state and spell your name and give us your address. My name is Barbara Dixel. D is in David, I X E L is in Larry. I live at 62A, Piazza Vittoria, Freehold, New Jersey, 07728, The Villages. Okay, hold on one second, Mrs. Dixel. Mr. Alfieri, you heard Ms. Dixel is seeking to read something into the record from the uh, from the HOA from the villages. Do you have an objection? Well, the, is Mrs. Dixel a, a, a member of the board of directors? Oh, oh, oh. no, I'm a, I'm a county committee woman from the villages. All right, so All right. I would object to any statement read, uh, read on the behalf of the Board of Directors if she's not a member of the Board of Directors. I don't know. Eileen, I gave, this, I gave the letter to you. I've delivered this letter to you from the Board. Can you read the letter into the record? Mr. Chair, hold on, Mrs. Dick. So, Mr. Chairman, what I would recommend is to the extent that I believe whatever that letter is also represents Miss Dixel's personal viewpoint that she just read it into the record and the board can give it its appropriate weight. So I, go ahead, Miss Dixel, please read it. I this letter to the Township Planning Board to Eileen twice. And I don't know why you're not. Mrs. Mrs. Dixel, Mrs. Dixel. We, yeah. we we've given we've given you the ability to read it. Please do so. The villages board of trustees and management are opposed to the application of Gill Petroleum to reopen um, as and 
active gas station with regular gas pumps, uh, diesel gas for trucks, and a convenience store. I also have bad eyesight. I'm trying. Okay. The villages. Okay. non-conforming lot in every direction. Um, it's our opinion that this gas station, if reopened, um, may operate with safety issues as it is all contaminated. Just bear with me. I have macular degeneration and my eyesight's not good, so just bear with me. Um, um, right directly opposite this gas station on Whitecliff Mills Road is the village's age-restricted development, 671 homes, and more than 1,000 elderly senior citizens. Several years ago, um, San T. Oh, I don't know. Uh, okay. Stan Tech flew Ryan Turner in from North Carolina uh, to meet with Mrs. Bixel, uh, a member of the Democratic County Committee and representative uh, for the villages. For the villages, he gave Mrs. Dixel maps of the gas station and the contamination. It took, it crossed Wycourt and went toward the river. Brian, the Brian, where does this end? I mean, come on. Okay, if you, want, if you want me to stop, I will. If you want me to stop, I will. It, it's it under the jurisdiction of an LSRP right now that's doing his job. Like who is a licensed? Mrs. Mr. Rosser, I, I I I get it. Let me let me see if I can deal with it. Mrs. Dixel, is this the same letter that was issued to the planning board in August of this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, then we have we have read it. And we understand it. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to the letter, or add, or provide any testimony or comments for you personally, please? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, hold on. Just a minute. I also have a letter from. Okay. I have a letter from uh, Richard Doobie, who is the the. Previous, who's now retired, he's the previous uh, major access permit manager uh, for DOT. And um, I had written to him, and, and his response to me was... Do we, do we have a copy, Mrs. Dixel? Do we have a copy of that letter that you're about to discuss? Uh, I mean... The last time you asked me to give you one of everything that I have, and I gave it to you. Okay. Hold on one second. I, I gave you one of everything in my box. Hold on one second. Doobie's letter is dated December 29, 2015. I believe pretty confidently, Mr. Chair, that we have seen this letter. There is, oh. Mr. Doobie's letter is now up on the screen. Mr. Chair, with, with, with all due respect, okay, we've seen all this stuff. And, and we've rehashed this over and over and over. 
again, I'm going to state my point for the last time, and I'm, I'm going to put myself on mute. We have an LSRP that is taking care of the property. Former property owner is the responsible party. They're doing I, everything I, right. We're doing – we're going over this. I mean, I, I, I feel bad right now for the gills, to be honest, that they're going through this process over and over again. And that's where I – that's where I stand. Mr. Hauser, I, I appreciate I appreciate your comments, but we're unfortunately in the public portion of testimony. And we we held we held Mrs. Dixel. We held Mrs. Dixel to the feet to the fire when she was able to, to ask questions of each one of the witnesses through this process. And we told her she would have the opportunity to provide her testimony. Okay. And we kept we kept pulling her back. So so you Miss, Mrs. Dixel. Things that you've discussed in the past, as far as your your comments to the applicants, if you could provide your a testimony that you've always wanted to provide during the the right, so the event, we really we'd really uh, like to hear about your testimony, please. So okay, will will all the will will the property be landscaped and burned? Will 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 the lighting not be too bright for the villagers, residents that are right opposite with, right opposite the gas station? Um, will the the seniors residents are, are are entitled to a quality of life? Um, it, 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 well, it, this thing is a, it's a detriment to the public good, to be honest with you. But, well, we'll, we'll okay, the, the lighting, the signs, the signs, the size of the signs, will, will they can be not abusive? Okay, what else you got? Um, okay, your, your vehicle, your vehicle uh, uh, plans. Are you, are, you, are you coming in on 9 North and going out on Wyckoff? I, I, this is Mr. Alfieri speaking. I, these are all questions that we answered uh, during testimony. We could, I, could, I could summarize the responses. Well, let's, let, let's let Mrs. Dixel finish, and you can respond okay. in any way you think is appropriate. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mrs. Dixel. When you come in on, when you came on nine and with an oil tanker truck, go out on Wyckoff. On the corner of Wyckoff and Strickland is the village's entrance. There's also a four-ton weight limit sign there. They cannot go down Wyckoff Mills Road. There's a four-ton weight limit sign on the corner of County Road 524 in Wyckoff. I believe the testimony was... I believe the testimony, Mrs. Dixel, was they were going in and out of Route 9 only, but we'll we'll, we'll make note of it and have the applicant uh, restate that how they're how they're going to direct traffic for the trucks. Okay, let me finish. An oil tanker truck with the amount of traffic that's coming up and down Wyckoff and Strickland, with Woolies on one corner and Exxon on the other corner, and they cannot. The, the traffic is so massive that oil tanker trucks are going to have a hard time making a left turn on Strickland and Wyckoff to go to Route 9, either north or south. Can, can your oil tanker trucks stay in and out on Route 9 like they are on Exxon? There is no Exxon that's open in the back. They have to... Uh, according to how, according to how Ordman, um, that, that the gas station has to be on an intersection. This one isn't. It's in the middle of the street. So Exxon oil tanker trucks are in and out on Route 9. You, your, your oil tanker trucks need to be in and out on Route 9. I'm desperately afraid of one of these trucks hitting a, a, a tank. There's, there's an undersized non-performing lot in every direction. I, I don't know how an oil tanker truck is going to um, deliver gasoline, whether it's diesel, regular, the convenience store, cars, and customers. I, I fear for some oil tanker truck hitting either a gasoline tank, a car, a person, or the store. 
Can you let them tanker trucks? And I know that it's going to be tough for them to back up. But going in on 9 North and coming out on White Horse really is not good. And, and uh, what, are they going to deliver gasoline 24-7 at what hours? But what are the hours of, that they're going to deliver gasoline? Well, we're, we're, we're taking notes of all of your comments, Mrs. Dixel, and then, then the applicant's going to answer them. Okay. What else? Mr. Okay. Chair, weren't these all answered already? No, I was never given the chance but, to but test. Mr. Mr. Chair, my recommendation, rather than arguing with Mrs. Dixel, is let her finish. The applicant yeah, right. will respond however it feels appropriate. Um. Exxon does not deliver gasoline at all hours of the day and night. They're, they're finished like eight, nine o'clock. What, what, what hours are you going to open in the morning? Can, can anybody give any type of consideration to the villagers, residents who live there, and and sort of adjust your hours? And and, and well, let's, let's see what they let's see what they say, Mrs. Dick. So what else do you have, please? Well, I'll, I'm just concerned about um, uh, the garbage being um, all encased. Um, are they going to do any, like, berming or landscaping on this thing? Because right now, it's an absolute eyesore. Yeah, great. What else you got? Um, my main concern is the dignity and the quality of life of the village's residents. Please. Uh, with the sign, you sign the noise, the delivery of gasoline at one hour, and and go and going in nine north, in nine north out on White Cross and making the left turn at uh, White Cross and Strickland, and they can't go because of the four ton weight limit sign. So again, please um, please address some of my concerns. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Mrs. Dixel. Mr. Alfieri, do you have the list? I do, and I'm gonna, I'll am going i do my best. I, I know Ms. Dixel did have an opportunity to ask every witness a question or many questions during the course of her testimony, and I believe all of them were answered. I'm, I'm looking at my notes to try and at least tell you what I have as notes from comments. One is lighting. We did have our engine. It was asked specifically that we provide um, the um, light, light lighting light. details and our engineer did come and present the testimony. Um, I um, can't technically uh, me, uh, uh, parrot what he said, but I, um, I believe that he, he did indicate that the lighting was satisfactory and would not have an impact on those neighbors. The landscaping, okay. um, my notes okay. were that um, a question was asked as to whether we could buffer the villages. And my, my, my notes say that Shari felt we were doing as much as we could in that area. And the chief of police who was, on, who was at the meeting as a board member believed that the villages had added the buff on their own property. Uh, and there shouldn't be any additional planting on this property on this side. As far as truck traffic is concerned, uh, Mr. Ray provided a very detailed testimony in support of the, the site circulation um, access to the roads, et cetera. The board can, if it feels ne necessary, impose whatever limitations it feels is necessary. Um, I, I can't remember the delivery time of the actual gasoline. I've looked through my notes. I don't see anything indicating what time limit that was. Um, but again, the, the, these questions were asked and answered. Um, I know the lighting was shielded. Uh, I think those were all of her questions. Garbage is got your gar the garbage is encased. Yeah, we have the dump we have the dumpsters and enclosures, uh, and and the site's at wreck now. This will be nicely maintained once it's built and operational. It's it'll be an improvement. 
and sign sizes are within the ordinance requirements. You require well, there were, no we, variance. We had multiple sign variances at the beginning and we greatly reduced them, but there are variances simply because we're all road frontage. So we really, we really can't comply with the full sign standards. But just to summarize, there's a freestanding sign. Um, there's a, one canopy, there's canopy sign on the, um, on the islands. Then there's a, Dodd sign on the convenience store. All the other signs that I had been. Does this law as the sign is not so bright? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, we opened it up to Ms. Dixel. She's had her opportunity. Mr. Alfieri is now answering. Absolutely, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah okay. The, and the testimony was that at the time that the lighting, both the signs and the actual lighting, um, were not going to not going to have provide any additional light onto the villages that already doesn't exist on Route Nine. The hours of operation. Well, they the hours of operation were twenty four seven um, through the testimony. Um, client can control the delivery time. Board wants to impose reasonable limitations on when that can take place because they do control their vendors. So you're saying you're putting on on testimony that the applicant would would limit their truck deliveries to normal working hours. That's well, yeah, yeah, I th I think you may want to say maybe till 9 p.m. because. Um, you may get a delivery after six o'clock. I don't know what the normal working hour is, but it won't be one a.m. in the morning, sir. So, so nine p.m. That's fine. And what what would be the start date that would be acceptable? Um, I, seven a.m. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Cucciaro. Yes. As, as Mrs. Dixel con concluded her testimony. Yes. At this point, mm -hmm. should we move on to see if the next applicant is? Uh, or no, I'm sorry. There, is there any other witnesses that would like to speak? Sorry, yes. getting late. Yes. yes. We, any other member of the public wish Thank to you, ask? Mrs. Dixel. We wish to ask questions of these two witnesses or provide mm -hmm. testimony. Everybody is in the hearing, so if they want to speak, they need to unmute. Okay, Mr. Chair, everyone's in the hearing. No one has expressed an interest. I, I think you can close the hearing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Alferi. Does, does that, I miss, one last time, this concludes your your testimony. Yes, we have no further witnesses. I just want to make a one minute summation when, when if and when you're ready. Um, I Let me just ask the board if there's anybody else on the board that has any further comments or questions. Seeing none, go ahead, Mr. Alfieri. Just, I just want to remind the board of some of the conditions that we had agreed to during the course of the testimony. Uh, we had agreed, of course, to address all of the technical comments contained within the board professional reports. We have agreed that the LSRP will be on site for all subgrade construction activity. We agreed that there will be no indoor seating at the convenience store. Um, we, we agreed to install a crosswalk on Wyckoff Mills Road. We agreed to meet with, um, it was Mr. Herman at the time, um, so we meet with the township engineer to come up designed so that there would be a crosswalk to the to the traffic signal. Um, we agreed to, uh, oh, there was a question of whether the board wanted us to bank two parking spaces at the, um, the southernmost portion of the property. Uh, there was never a decision made. Um, if we did bank those two spaces, the lot coverage variance would be eliminated. Um, agreed that the diesel fuel area would be limited to vans and small box trucks and cars, but no yeah, larger Mr. vehicles. Chair, just, uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with that because if it's banked, it could 
be developed at some point. Right, only during the period of time when it's banked. But you're right, if they're installed subsequently, if the board wants, if the town required it, then the variance would be triggered. And the last thing we agreed to previous to tonight was that we would have bollards placed in the areas. We'd work with your engineer to make sure there were bollards in the various locations, parking spaces. And then tonight we agreed to that delivery time limitation. Um, and we'd request based on those conditions and any other conditions the board wishes to impose that the board grant the approval. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alferi, I, I also believe from remember my me remembering from the testimony, the um, exhaust fan for the kitchen hood that was going out the back of the building, which would be visible from Route 9 if you're traveling south on Route 9, uh, that you are going to provide appropriate screening to make sure that that uh, mechanical apparatus was was part of the architecture and not necessarily just sewn as a silver. That's that's correct. Silver. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also have in my notes that the LSRP will submit the remedial investigation report and permit upon approval from the DEP. And I also had that sidewalk was going to be installed on the property. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I'll entertain a motion. So an affirmative motion would be to grant preliminary and final site plan approval uh, with ancillary, uh, all ancillary variants and design waiver relief and including all conditions placed upon the record. Uh, per, per Ron's uh, just conversation, I will make a motion to do that. Do I have a second? Second. I'm second. Okay. I think that was Roll a call, please. Uh, actually, do, do, um, do you have the list of everybody who is eligible? I forgot to ask that when we first started this. The only people eligible are Mr. Dorado, Mr. Husser, Mr. Leggio watched the videos and certified so he can vote, Mr. Seaman and Mr. Tannenhaus. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Eileen. Roll call, please. I watched the videos. You did? Okay, I didn't know that, Dave, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll just need you to fill out the certification after the hearing. Ended. Mr. Dorado? Yes. Mr. Husser? Yes. Mr. Leggio? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. Mr. Everett? Yes. And Chairman Tannenhaus? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thank you. Good night. Right. Eileen, you'll send me that certification? I will, Dave. Thank you. Okay. Can we can we mute, mute Mrs. Dixon? Well, I think we're just about to adjourn anyway. We are. Everybody have a good night. Okay. Good night. Well, we I, have... I think we don't have we don't have any reason to go to some type of executive session or or, or further discuss. And we are we are meeting one more time before the holidays. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No so we'll say. Only two little things on there, so hopefully it's okay, we'll send our holiday. We'll send our holiday wishes at that time. Okay. 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 I'll make yeah. a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. So moved. All in favor. Aye. 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 You well. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.